Okay, so let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Welcome, welcome uh, to Parallels Remote Application Server Basic Training. My name is Don Klemmer. I'm a sales engineer with Parallels, and I'm going to be taking you through the training today. Uh, a few housekeeping items before we get started. First off, I know it looks like you're all by yourself in the WebEx. You are not. There are many, many people attending today. Thank you all very much for, uh, for being here. Uh, it's just kind of a quirk of the WebEx where it does look like you're by yourself. And secondly, questions, please ask them as we go along. Use the chat window. I have this up on another screen. I can see the chat window kind of out of the corner of my eye, and I'll try to answer questions as best I can. But I'll definitely get them all answered before we leave, and I can look at them during the breaks. Uh, there's also a Q&A section you can use as well. I prefer the chat window just because it's on top and it's a little bit easier for me to see, but you can use the Q&A window as well if you'd like. Uh, there's also, uh, well, unfortunately, we can't have audible questions. I wish we could, but as soon as I take everybody off administrative mute, somebody puts us on hold, we get static, uh, there's echoes, all sorts of things, and the audio quality just goes down. So unfortunately, administrative mute it is. However, like I said, please ask your questions as we go along. I'll leave some time at the end for Q&A, but... Um, if we just ask them as we go along, I'll try to answer them that way, and then we won't have uh, that much to do at the end. Okay, we do have a lot to cover today. We're going to be going through a lot of things. I'm going to start with, uh, very briefly, the high-level architecture of Parallels Remote Application Server. Then we will install RAS, and we're going to use the best practices to do that. Then we will configure the Parallels RAS components. We'll cover some additional features. And of course, all through this, we're going to be preparing ourselves for the certification exam. Okay, like I said, we've got a lot to cover. Uh, we're going to do this in about three hours, so I'm going to be going fairly quickly. However, there will be at least two breaks in here. I can't talk that long at once without taking a break myself, and I know we'd all like to appreciate that as well. There are different pieces and components to the training. This is the online section. We're going to be doing, like I said, about three hours. It's going to be lecture, demo, lecture, demo, and then answering questions. But this isn't the only part of the training that's available. There are also training manuals. There's a training and lab manual that's available to you. There are labs associated with this course. However, we are not going to do them here today together. Uh, they're available offline uh, to kind of do at your own leisure as you want. Um, both of those are available in the partner portal. There's also a follow-up email that will explain to you how to, or at least we'll have links to them if you don't have access to the partner portal for whatever reason. Additionally, there will be a copy of the slides and a recording. This recording also will be made available to you so you can listen to me over and over again at your leisure, which I'm sure everybody would like to do. And then as I said throughout this, what we're doing is preparing for the certification exam. The certification exam is online and it is open book, so it shouldn't be too difficult once you install Parallels and go through the course. If you're wondering what is certification exam, what are you talking about? It probably means that you're not a Parallels partner, but you're a customer. Welcome, welcome. We're very glad to have you here as well. However, you don't have to worry about the exam. It's not an industry exam um, or anything like that. It's more just a certification exam so that we know that our partners are qualified to go talk to our joint customers uh, about Parallels RAS together. So if you're a customer, good news, you don't have to worry about the exam. Uh, for those of you that are partners, you can log into the Parallels Partner Portal, and here you have access to some different uh, tech, uh, different components. You can access the training from here. If you just select, uh, I believe it still looks like this, Parallels RAS Training, and then you can uh, sign up uh, for the Take the Certification Exam. There is a, this is the basic exam. There's also an advanced course and an advanced exam that you can take as well. Uh, the login to the portal is up here. That's the URL, https colon forward slash forward slash parallels underscore raz dot partner prm dot com. There'll be links to this um, in the follow up emails, etc. And you also can access the training material here. If you do not have access to the partner portal because you're not a partner, uh, that follow-up email will have links to these additional components as well, such as, like I said, the training materials and the recordings and uh, the slide deck and all of that. Okay, so moving along, uh, just a quick teaser, there is also an advanced RAS training course. It comes out, I think, once a quarter, maybe a little bit more briefly uh, or more frequently than that. Uh, I think there's been talk about updating it. 
Um, regardless, it's out when it's out. Uh, it's going to cover a bunch of topics that we're not going to get in today. Most of these are for service providers or would be of most interest to service providers, although other people can kind of take a look at them as well. Uh, we're going to cover topics such as multi-tenancy, uh, Azure AD, and SAML. We're going to configure SAML and talk about SAML, uh, VDI on Azure, and WVD. So we've implemented that on Azure as well. Uh, we're also going to cover some advanced troubleshooting, cloud-based load balancing, and then a few other topics in there as well. But that's in the advanced training course, uh, not so much in the basic course today. Okay, and with all that, there are still some other resources that are available for you out there. If you just go to http colon forward slash forward slash parallels dot com slash product slash rest slash support, that'll take you right to this page. I never remember all that. I go to parallels.com, I click on support, and then I click on RAS, and that takes you to the same page. But on that page is the Parallels Knowledge Base. So it's an online knowledge base that you can do searching uh, to come up with topics and uh, troubleshooting and all sorts of other stuff in there that you might find in a knowledge base for Parallels RAS. There's also uh, links there to contact uh, support. And then if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a very not so obvious little blue link that says uh, technical documentation and resources. That's where all the documentation is for Parallels RAS. The admin guide, the solutions guide, best practices, printing best practices, some architecture references, all sorts of stuff are on there um, available as well. So don't forget about those resources as well when you're looking for technical topics for Parallels. All right, uh, this is the only two marketing slides that I really have today. This, um, we're going to be covering many of those, although not all of the, or many of these. We're not going to be covering all of these today. Things uh, like SAML um, are going to be in the advanced training. Things such as the RESTful API or really kind of beyond what we've been doing online. There's some um, different types of uh, documentation and resources for that. But the main point I want to make is Parallels Remote Application Server is chock full of all sorts of features and components and all this available to you. And this is the key slide because it's all available to you at one cost. There's no expensive add-ons. There's no advanced enterprise platinum plus data center edition. It's just one product. It's licensed purely by concurrent user. That's the only way we license it. And once that you're is done, you're available or, or it's available to you to use any part of the server or any part of the software that you'd like to use. Uh, we don't limit it by uh, the number of servers or the number of components or different add-ons or anything like that. None of that is out there. It's just purely by concurrent user. Um, and the other nice thing about the licensing model is it also includes upgrades. So whenever we release a new version, you're entitled to go to the latest and greatest as soon as you're ready. And beyond that, it also includes support. I mean, how great is that? So you don't have to pay anything extra for support. So you have full access to 24-7 support uh, as soon as you purchase the product. Okay, and with that, that takes care of the housekeeping. Let's go ahead and we'll move on into the training. Okay, so Parallels Remote Application Server Basic Architecture and Concepts. We're going to go through this pretty quickly, but I think it's very helpful to have an understanding about how the pieces and parts fit together. So this slide is going to show us the traffic flow between the components, and then I'll show you how to start small and scale out, and then we'll get into a little bit more detail. The two boxes on that are red kind of on top next to each other, the publishing agent, that's what we call our controller, the connection broker, um, runs on Windows, it installs by default when you install Parallels. The two purplish boxes just off center stacked on top of each other with the locks on them that say Secure Client Gateway. That's the component that the end users actually will connect to. Um, it's the gateway piece. Uh, the web interface is installed there. That usually does the processing of the SSL certificates and so forth. Uh, the other two boxes on the right that say RDSH, your terminal servers, if you like that name, or remote desktop servers, if you like the newer names, or remote desktop session host, whatever you want to call them. It's that Microsoft component that actually handles the applications and um, the session management information. We lay down a very small agent that allows us to uh, manage those. So if you just install Parallels RAS on a Windows server and go next, 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 and take the defaults, you'll end up with one of each, one of, each of these, a publishing agent, a secure, secure client gateway, and a remote desktop session host server all on a single server because we can scale down very, very small. We'll cover that in just a second. 
I've split the components apart and added a second one just so we could understand the traffic flow here. The other piece all by itself there on the left is the high availability load balancer. It's the one component that does not run on Windows. It is a virtual appliance, so you just download it, import it into your hypervisor, and then run it that way. It does what I call front-end load balancing. It's included in the solution, but it is a separate download, and you can have more than one if you'd like for redundancy. I kept just the one here, just so we could understand how it works and see the traffic flow. So the process for this is that an end user will go ahead and make a connection to the Parallels farm. Right? They're going to most likely hit the load balancer. They're going to connect over port 80 or port 443 using either the Parallels client or the HTML5 interface. The load balancer is just uh, does simple NLB, network load balancing, does simple round robin. So the first user coming in, it's going to direct the load balancer, to, will direct them to the secure client gateway number one, also connecting over port 80 or 443. The gateway kind of does the heavy lifting of this architecture, but it's dumb, so it doesn't know what to do. So the gateway is going to get this connection. It's going to ask the publishing agent what to do with it. The publishing agent, remember, is the controller, the connection broker. The publishing agent will then have Active Directory do the authentication. We don't authenticate anything in Parallels. We use AD. So Active Directory will provide the authentication. Once that's done, the publishing agent will then query Active Directory for the group membership of the end user. And then based on that information, we will then deliver the stuff to the end user, whatever it is they're supposed to be getting, a desktop, the applications, whatever. Okay. Next user that comes in, well, hey, last time we went to the load balancer, um, it sent us the number one. This time it's going to send us the number two because it's using round robin, right? So it'll go to gateway number two, and then the same exact process will take place. It's going to go to the publishing agent, have Active Directory do its stuff, query AD, and then based on that, here's the end user experience. We are using the RDP protocol, but notice that exists really only between the secure client gateway and the remote desktop session host, right? That's the only place we're using port 3089 is between those two. The end users are not coming into the system over that. They're coming in over port 80 or 443. Okay, so the next user comes in and what do we think is going to happen here? Well, yeah, you guessed it, back to number one, and then it's going to go through the publishing agent, AD, the whole rigmarole, and so on and so forth, okay? So that's what the load balancer does. It just load balances the incoming connections between the secure client gateways. So it's what I call front-end load balancing. Now, Parallels is fully load balanced end-to-end, -end, so you'll notice these seemingly random lines going to the remote desktop session host servers. Well, they're not. We're actually load balancing those servers but for that component, we're not using um, just round robin. We're using resource-based load balancing. So we're gonna take a look at the number of sessions and balance that with the CPU and the memory utilization and then make kind of an intelligent decision to do that. So in this scenario, I'll pull up these little cartoons. Maybe the users on number one, remote desktop server number one, are actually doing work. They're sitting there with their keys, heads down over the keyboard, banging away. And the users on the other server Fewer of them, there's more of them, but perhaps they're not driving so much workload through the server. So in this scenario, when the next user connects, we very well may send them to number two because it's not being used as heavily. However, we're not gonna overload this server with sessions because we are balancing the number of sessions as well. I mean, all those people that aren't so busy on number two could come back and, and get busy. So we are doing fully uh, resource-based load balancing all the way. So you have the load balancer that does the round robin front end load balancing. The publishing agent is load balancing the remote desktop servers on the back end using resource based load balancing. So we have front end load balancing, back end load balancing. The product is fully load balanced end to end. And also because this is an all in one solution and everything is included, if you have a VDI user, they're going to use the same exact infrastructure except we're going to hand them off to a a VDI desktop so they can get their VDI desktop that way. Or hypervisor agnostic, we'll talk a little bit more about VDI in a little bit, but um, uses the same exact infrastructure. You can do remote desktop servers, you can VD use VDI, you can do both mix and match in the same environment. It's up to you. It's the same parallels license at least. That other little box that popped up is a physical PC, the remote PC. We actually can use this infrastructure to um, Broker connections to a remote PC, a physical PC, if you will. So you could do that uh, if you suddenly had to, I don't know, work from home in a pinch. You didn't have the server infrastructure to support a bunch of terminal servers or VDI, but you did have physical desktops sitting on people's desks. You could actually have them 
uh, just remote control to PC. Same license, same thing. <clears throat> okay, and then from the internet, since we are talking about working home, uh, we would like that traffic to be encrypted via uh, using SSL, right? So that's what we'll do. So if you're going to have them connect from home, you would open up just one port on your external firewall, port 443. That's the only port that you'd need to open. We would then create a public facing address that maps to your internal address, usually the load balancer or the virtual IP of the load balancer. I'll cover that in a moment. And you just create a NAT, right? Network address translation. So users would connect to the public IP, they'd go through the firewall over 443, and then they would hit the load balancer. Okay, so that's really all you need to do there. Yes, you can use a different port other than 443 or port 80 if you weren't using SSL because your users are on-prem. Uh, you can change those ports if you'd like. Just remember the defaults are 443 and 80. So if you change it on the server side, you need to change it on the end user side as well. Okay, and then uh, like I said, they can come in over the Parallels client or they can use the HTML5 interface. We have a Parallels client for just about every kind of device out there. Windows, Chromebooks, Macs, um, <clears throat> mobile devices such as iOS, Android devices, Linux, uh, so a variety of thin clients are supported. So just about every other client platform out there will work and they can connect over. Okay, so let's talk about sizing and scale a little bit. As I mentioned, one of the really nice things about Parallels uh, RAS is when you install it, you can install it on a single server. So it starts really easy to do. You just literally, you can install, run the installer, take the defaults, next, 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 and you end up with a single server running a publishing agent, a remote desktop server, and the secure client gateway. So very quick to kind of get started. Um, this is completely full featured. It's not limited or crippled in any way. Um, you can do remote application server or remote desktop servers. You can do VDI or you can do both in this kind of environment. Okay. Uh, very quick and easy to install. It's great to get started to perform functional testing like this. It's great for test dev environments. Uh, we also have a large number of customers running this in production because they're in an environment where the cost is more important than resiliency. And that's not Parallels cost. You can have as many servers and as much redundancy as you'd like with Parallels. It doesn't change your licensing. But if you have additional compute costs, software costs, virtual machines, because you're running this in a, a cloud environment or whatever, or just Windows, Microsoft software licensing costs, um, any of those things uh, might be a consideration to do this. But Parallels, you certainly is, should not be a consideration for that. Okay, so you can start really small in this environment. You also can then scale out if you'd like. So just because you've done this doesn't mean that you've locked yourself into this. Almost everybody starts installing this way. And then the next step would be perhaps to add a second all-in-one server. And then you would have two all-in-one servers. We'd introduce a load balancer for some uh, load balancing there, the high availability load balancer HALB. That's the acronym for that. It's kind of an awkward word to say, but at least it's descript uh, descriptive. And remember, the HALB is load balancing just the gateway component here. Um, so I've now expanded my environment a little bit. I've got a two-server solution, and I've added redundancy or scalability. I haven't really added both because I'd have to do N plus 1 for both. And then again, this costs exactly the same from a parallels perspective as the previous slide. Now, if you'd like to scale more, the next step would be to start breaking off those remote desktop session host servers from the, uh, what we'll call them management servers, the publishing agent gateway servers. So I'll break those out, okay? Notice I've also added two load balancers here. So I can have two load balancers. They run in a master-slave arrangement and they share a virtual IP address. And that virtual IP address is configured within Parallels RAS. So you don't have to do anything fancy or funky with your own networking. You can do this within RAS. Either load balancer can answer to the virtual IP address so that if you have a failure in either one of those components, the other one will automatically take over. Uh, just uh, as an FYI, a load balancer can support somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 to 2,000 concurrent connections. Okay, so somewhere about that is the maximum support for this set of load balancers. Uh, if you need to go beyond that, uh, you would be looking at either using perhaps a different set of load balancers as well, or what most people would do is go to a third-party load balancer, like a Brocade or an F5 or something like that. Honestly, you could even use a Citrix Netscaler. Okay, so you could do something like that. Um, 
because it is just using NLB network load balancing, it's, we're compatible with anything. If you're running this in a cloud environment, such as in Azure or AWS, I would recommend that you do not use our load balancers there. Uh, the cloud providers do not like uh, third-party virtual appliances. They want you to use their own stuff up there. Uh, so they make it difficult to import a load balancer up there. Uh, plus, they have their own load balancing services that they would rather you use. And it actually is a lot cheaper if you use their load balancing service uh, services. So use those instead of our load balancer. We cover that topic more in the advanced training, if you like. Okay, so once you're at this point, you can scale out quite a bit, actually, because the pieces on the left, just those four servers, if you will, the two virtual appliances, the load balancers, and the two management servers, those will support about 500 users concurrently. Uh, the management servers don't have to be very beefy either. Two virtual CPUs or regular CPUs if you're using physical servers and probably four maybe eight gigs of memory would be enough um, to handle that and then that'll support about 500 uh, concurrent users. You know your mileage may vary a little bit but that's roughly about what you're going to be getting. As for the pieces on the right, well, you know, it depends what you're doing. You're going to need as many remote desktop servers or VDI desktops as you need, and it depends on the applications, the usage, the type of workload that you're using. That's a whole different ball of wax. But just the management pieces on the left, about 500 users. And then if you'd like to scale out more, we can do that simply by breaking all of the components out so that they run on their separate servers. So now I've got, obviously, the load balancers running by themselves, but now I have a secure client gateway by itself, I have a publishing agent by itself, and then I've obviously got the remote desktop servers running by themselves, or VDI if you want to go down that route. So a single gateway running by itself like that can support about 750 to 1,000 users-ish. Again, your mileage may vary a little bit. It's possible. I've heard of some customers getting upwards of around 1,200 users. If you're putting a lot of traffic through it, you may see that number go down below 750 as well. So it just depends on the type of traffic and the nature of what it is that you're doing, but somewhere in that range is what a secure client gateway can handle. There's no limit on the number of secure client gateways. You can have as many of them as you'd like, keep adding, and like I said, until you get to that, that N plus one. The publishing agents. Um, I have two of them up here, the master publishing agent and the secondary publishing agent. The master does about 60% of the work. The secondary publishing agent does about 40% of the work. They are both active-active. Um, they have an internal database. The way our architecture is set up, we don't require or utilize an external SQL database, so you never have to worry about that as far as the publishing agents are concerned. That's one of the reasons it installs so quickly. They just replicate their own database internally very quickly. You don't even have to do anything for that. It happens automatically. But two of those are active-active, and they're tested to about 7,500 users is our testing limit for a single RAS, let's call it a site. I'll show you about sites and farms in a moment. You can have a third one if you'd like, or a fourth one if you'd like. We usually would put that in standby mode. Uh, we kind of keeps them from stepping on each other, keeps the traffic down. So you would have active, active, passive. Um, and then of course, if one of the others fails, then the other ones can take over. If the master fails for whatever reason, the secondary or even the standby can step up to the plate and take over immediately. Okay, so about 7,500 users, that, users that'll scale to. I talked about the load balancer requirements of about 2,000 total connections, and beyond that, like I said, probably use a third-party load balancer. And then at that point, like I said, you can scale the environment to our testing limit, which is about 7,500 users. You just keep adding remote desktop servers and VDI instances or whatever it is that you're doing until you reach the maximum number there. Okay, if you go beyond that, well, that's a great time to create perhaps a second farm or a second RAS site. Now, one thing that's new, starting back and or starting with version 18 and later, so if you're on an earlier version of RAS, you can't do this, but if you're on a, a more modern version, you can. But it used to be we could only support one set of load balancers. So a common scenario would be that I've got my load balancers out in a DMZ for my external users. It's a really nice solution that way because just running a couple of virtual appliances, even if somebody penetrates the first firewall somehow, they're, they're hitting two virtual appliances that are locked down Linux appliances. You can't do much with those. 
right? So that's usually what we'd recommend putting up in the DMZ. Uh, but the problem in that case is your internal users then either couldn't use our load balancers or they would have to exit the internal firewall and come back in. However, uh, again, starting in version 18, we've added the capability to have multiple load balancers. And I'll show you how to do this when we uh, do the install. Very easy to do. You just simply add a second set of load balancers. Um, each load balancer does have its own set of virtual IPs, so they operate pretty much independent of each other, but they can load balance the same gateways or you also could do something like this scenario if you can have different sets of load balancers going to different gateways. So that's a possibility as well. Um, so either one of those scenarios will work. Uh, okay. Okay, so let's go ahead and move on to Parallels RAS site since I've mentioned that a couple of times. Uh, RAS farm is the highest level component and inside a farm there is either a single site or multiple sites. If you just install Parallels RAS, or when you install Parallels RAS and you take the defaults next, 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 and you end up with that single server running all the components, you have also installed a single farm and a single site. Now a site consists of, at a minimum, a publishing agent, a gateway, and then something to publish from. So to be fully functional, it's got to have a remote desktop server, a VDI instance, or at least a remote PC. So it's got to have something to publish from, but it needs all three of those components to be a functional site. Keep in mind that the very first farm, the master publishing agent there, is the licensing server for the entire farm and all the sites. And because of that, at a bare minimum, the master publishing agent in each site must be able to communicate with each other. So they've got to be on the same LAN or connected by a, a static and consistent VPN or something of that nature, right? You've got to be able to talk to each other. And truly, because we're active-active and we like uh, full redundancy, you really want all the publishing agents to be able to talk to each other. So at a minimum, that's what your networking needs to look like, okay? Um, also, um, all the sites have to be in the same Active Directory domain. So they've got to be using the same domain, or if you're in multiple domains, there has to be a two-way trust relationship between them. So if you've got multiple independent active directories going on that have nothing to do with each other, then uh, sites are not the way for you. You'd be going forward with multiple farms. And remember, uh, the good news about RAS is that multiple farms cost the same as one farm. You just have two keys instead of one key, but it has the same number of total users. Okay. So a, uh, the reason to use sites, the most common reason, is that you have users that float back and forth between different locations. and um, when doing that, you'd like their license to be able to follow them back and forth. So that's really a good reason to use this. Uh, you might be able to use it in a DR scenario where you just kind of have a skeleton site, if you will, running in your, your DR um, environment, and then, but it's not being used because there's no users there, they're consuming no licenses, so it doesn't cost you anything extra, at least as far as Parallels licensing is concerned. And then if they uh, goes down and everyone starts logging into the DR site, well, hey, then the licenses will light up. So speaking about uh, disaster scenarios, as I said, that very first server is your RAS licensing server. And so if you sever connections, if the network goes down or if site one has a power outage and goes down or something like that, um, then your other sites are orphaned and they're looking at where's my licensing server? Well, have no fear. An orphaned site, if you will, can run for three full days without you having to do anything. So you got three full days uh, that'll just run, 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 um, without having to talk to the master publishing agent. Um, so you've got three days for that to come back online, restore the networking, something like that. If during that time, you know, maybe site one has fallen into a black hole, or we had a big natural disaster, a hurricane that hit or something like that, or a cyclone, and it's gonna take out the, um, the site one, and it's not coming back for a long time, if ever, it's very easy to move the licensing server. I'll show you how to do that in a second. So uh, no problems there. To deploy a site, uh, we would do that from then the, within the RAS farm. So you would just go to uh, the RAS console and you go up to the farm category, click on farm, click on farm in the little sub panel at the top, and then um, uh, you could just do the add. There's a little plus there. I think you can right click add, whatever. And you would just go to add, and then it's gonna push the components to a RAS or to a server somewhere. So it's gonna push 
a publishing agent and then usually a gateway if you decide to go that route as well and it'll push it out there. So it's a single pane of glass so to deploy a farm you must do it from within the RAS uh, management console that you're using to manage your primary farm. If you just run the RAS installer on another server and end up with a RAS farm over there, you've created two separate farms and you can't join them again, right? So once you've got two separate farms, there's no way to tie them together. So to push a, a site out, you have to do it from the RAS management console here. And then once you're in that one console, you can manage multiple sites at once from the same management console. However, you're only managing one at a time. So you go back to the section of the console and you'd right click and then choose switch to the site. Okay, so that's how you do it. You just switch to the site and then you're, you're now managing site two. And so everything that you in there about farm, publishing, printing, load balancing policies, all that only applies to site two. Then you could switch back and control site one again, so you're, or site three. So you're just managing the sites one at a time, although you can manage them from here. And also there, on that same little menu, you'll notice there is a set site as licensing server. So you can move the Parallels licensing server to a different site. So if that site two or site three, if they get orphaned because something happened to the master site or the networking or whatever, um, like I said, they'll run for three full days. But um, somewhere within that three days, if it's not going to come back, you would need to, to keep the farm or the site functional, you'd need to move the licensing server. So you just go right click, set site as licensing server, it's going to go out to parallels, it'll do its little magic in the background and it'll switch over and this will now be the licensing site. It can fall back over to the original site if it comes back up if you'd like, you can kind of pick and choose that, but it will set it. Just keep in mind if you're doing this, it's going to ask you for your parallels my account credentials. Those are the credentials that you first entered in to activate and apply the license to the farm. Okay, so just quickly to sum up here about sites, they're really most useful when you have floating users. A RAS license follows users between sites. You got one pool of licenses, and then uh, no matter where the users are, you're covered by that single pool. Like I said, a DR scenario also could be possible here as well. Uh, certain RAS settings can be rec replicated between sites. Uh, just refer to the admin guide to find out which, which settings can, but just be aware that some of those settings can be replicated between the sites. And then uh, the high availability I talked about here about a site being orphaned for three full days and you can promote a secondary site to the master site and blah, 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 and all that. So that's all available for you here. I just wanted to have this in the slides so you could see it as well as uh, hear me talk about it. All right, Parallels My Account, real quick. Um, when you register Parallels RAS, when you activate a trial, when you apply your license or do anything inside of the licensing within the console, you're actually tying into something called Parallels My Account, which is on the Parallels.com website. So if you go to Parallels.com and click on My Account, that's where you could use those credentials that you put in to log in and manage your licenses. So you can come here to manage Parallels licenses, you can contract support, there's a bunch of other administrative tasks as well. Because of this, a lot of people forget this because we just get busy with our lives, we install Parallels, we activate it, we do the license, and then we go about our business. Well, you really don't want this Parallels My Account tied to a single user, right? It'd be nice if, uh, you know, just in case somebody, uh, something happens, right? Uh, somebody else in the organization can get to this. So there's two ways to deal with that. You could use a service account in a service email, or, you can actually come into the Parallels account, and this is actually my preferred method, um, just create multiple users, right? So you can create multiple users, everybody's got their own logins, and then if somebody goes or leaves the company or organization for whatever reason, you can eject them from here. Um, so that's, that's what I would do. Uh, to do that, um, to create multiple users, you make sure that you're connected to your business account. Uh, typically it is just a business account, but we do have other products, and if you've registered some of our other more consumer-based products to um, the same service account or the same Parallels My account. It may show up as your personal account, so make sure you've selected your business account. Then you can go to your business profile and click on that link, and that will take you down to the users, and there you can create additional users if you'd like. You can manage account access, create users, revoke access. You can invite other users so they don't have to come here by themselves. You can just send them an email and say, hey, Go ahead, I want to make you an admin for users. Uh, there's also ways I think you can even limit to different classes of users. Maybe somebody can view but not change, 
things, that sort of stuff. But kind of make sure you clean up your Parallels My Account at some point. If you lose access to Parallels My Account because of the password or somebody leaves or whatever, um, it's not the end of the world. Contact support. It may be difficult to contact support without having Parallels My Account. Uh, contact your sales rep. They can open up a case for you and then support can then change the credentials or the emails or whatever here so that we can get you back in business. So it's not the absolute end of the world if you lose track of this, but it's much better to be proactive and not have to deal with this up front. Okay, let's go ahead and move on and start getting into the fun stuff. Enough of these slides. We're going to start doing the RAS core installation and configuration. Um, oh, wait, I guess I lied. Maybe one or two more slides, but real quick here. This is what we're going to be doing in the lab environment. Um, in the demo environment here, and this is also what you can be doing in your lab, is we're going to install RAS and create a single all-in-one server and then expand out and build out this infrastructure here. So two all-in-one servers will introduce the load balancer. We may even get crazy and introduce a second load balancer since uh, I can show you how we can do that now um, in the newer versions. And um, that'll be it. Once you get to this point, the basic concepts of how to scale out RAS will be there and you'll be able to do that. So the primary server is going to be, obviously, we're going to install the primary PA, the secure gateway, the remote desktop session host server. I'll add the RAS monitoring piece to it. And then on the secondary server, um, we'll essentially just push out the other components. We may get a chance to do reporting today. We'll have to see. It takes a little bit longer because that's the one piece that does SQL. But at the very least, I'll talk about that and then we'll introduce the HALB. Um, so real quick, a couple of things about the pre-installation steps I want to go through. Join your servers to Active Directory before you do this and get your IP address figured out and get a permanent host name set. Can you change any of these after the fact? Yes, you can if you have to. But it's much, much better uh, to get this done up front. And in that way, you don't have to worry about it. If you change the host name, by the way, um, that can cause you some problems on the master server, just the very first RAS server, the master publishing agent, because the host name is tied to, or, or not the host name, but the licensing server is tied to the MAC address and the host name. It creates a little hash of those in our code. So if you were to change that, it'll deactivate the server. And you're going to have to go update DNS and get in there and come around the back gate. Uh, that's also another good reason, by the way, if you're running in a virtual environment, as most people are, don't float MAC addresses around for these servers. You can use them for other things, but not for the, the primary server here because of that. Okay, so we'll do that. Uh, we're going to follow Parallels best practices. There is a document available for that. I'm going to walk you through that. Um, also in that document, it'll talk about things such as antivirus exclusions. So if you're running antivirus on there, sometimes that can interfere with the um, operations of Parallels Remote Application Server. Uh, sometimes it'll prevent it from installing. Sometimes it installs and everything looks good, but you're just having a lot of weird stuff going on. Sometimes that's because of antivirus. So if you can get those exclusions going, that'll solve us a lot of trouble up front. Uh, user account control, we do recommend that. I'm going to leave that one alone and not go through that. And the other piece is on the primary server, you're okay. So you don't have to disable the firewall, uh, the Windows firewall. But on the target servers, when we push to a second server, I can't push RAS components to another server where the firewall is up and running on Windows. Wouldn't be much of a firewall if I could do that. What I usually do is I disable the firewall temporarily, push the components, there's a RAS wizard which will actually add all the firewall um, ports that we need to have open for you and then just turn it back on. If you're in a situation where you have a physical firewall in between systems or you just cannot take down the firewall for whatever reason, you're going to need to open up these three ports, TCP 135, 445, and 49179, to at least get the components onto the server. There are additional ports that need to be opened as well for RAS to talk to each other, and at the very, or the RAS components to talk to each other, and at the very end of the um, administrator guide, there is a port reference section. So you'll need to kind of take a look at that. Okay, and with that, Let's get out of PowerPoint for a little bit, shall we? Thank goodness. And we'll go ahead and switch over to a server. Uh, very quickly, uh, just where I wanted to show you where all those documents were, now that I'm in a, a proper server with a web browser, if you just go to the parallels.com webpage, that's easy enough to remember. Uh, by the way, here is that my account up here I was talking about, so you can go there to log in. But if I go to support, 
And then if I just click on Parallels Remote Application Server, here's the Knowledge Base article I was talking about. Also, you have a way to sign in and contact support, again, using your uh, Parallels My Account uh, credentials. But what I really wanted to show you is if I scroll down, here's that very obvious link, Technical Documentation and Resources, right? Not so obvious, but it is there. So if I click on that, it takes me to this page and I can actually go back in time. So if you want earlier versions of RAS, you can get the documentation for those. But um, if that's what you're running, although you, like I said, you can always upgrade to the latest and greatest. But here's all these documents that you can have. Here's the admin guide. There is a new management portal that started in version 18. There's documentation for that. Uh, if you want to get into PowerShell or the REST API, they're there. The uh, reporting guide, some information about our licensing. And then here's that best practices document right here. Um, I highly recommend that you take a look at that. To be honest with you, that document has gotten a little bit too big, a little out of control. There's a lot of good information in it, but it's pretty large. But there is a section in there, I believe it's chapter three, on the tuning parameters. At the very least, look at that. And then there's some solutions guide, Visio stencils, and all sorts of other stuff. And if you scroll down, you can find all sorts of reference architectures and then um, way down at the bottom, we actually have uh, end user guides for the clients. So if you want to get to the ins and outs about how to use the, the Parallels client for Mac, well, here you go. There's a good spot for it. Okay, enough of that. So because this is going to be an all-in-one server, I'm going to go ahead into Server Manager, and I'm going to turn this into a remote desktop server right now. Now, we don't have to do this here manually. Parallels RAS has a wizard that will enable the remote desktop session host role for me. But I want to show you what's kind of going on in the background and what's being done. So if I go into Server Manager and I click on Man Manage, Add Roles and Features, I'll go here to Next. Don't choose this one. Do not choose the Remote Desktop Services installation. That installs the whole nine yards from Microsoft, the connection broker, their web portal, all that other stuff. We don't use any of that. Okay, so don't bother with that. I'm just gonna stay on the default one up here and go to Next. And yeah, it's this ser server I'm managing. And then I want to select the remote desktop services. And then I'll click next and next, because I'm not going to install any features at the moment. And one more next, where it's asking me to set up the remote desktop services piece. This one right here, the remote desktop session host. And yeah, I want to add all those features. That is the only role that's required by Parallels Remote Application Server. We take care of the rest of it. So you don't need the gateway, the connection broker, or anything like that you do somewhere have to run the remote desktop licensing server. Okay, that's what we call the Microsoft tax. You do have to license the terminal servers or remote desktop servers from, the, uh, from Microsoft, but you don't have to run it on this server. You can, there's not a technical reason for doing it. I just prefer not to. I don't like to run stuff like that on servers that users are gonna be directly interacting with. Uh, interacting with. The reason for that is just, you know, if something happens to the server for whatever reason, it, it sometimes can be a little difficult to reclaim those licenses from Microsoft. They're just a large company with a lot of bureaucracy is all it is. So I usually try to put them somewhere else, maybe a domain controller, maybe their own dedicated server, somewhere just where users aren't going to be interacting with the server uh, just for additional security. But you certainly can put it on the server if you want. Okay. So I'm gonna go ahead and click next and go ahead and run the installation. It will restart when it's done. Uh, that's why I'm going ahead and doing it now so we can save ourselves a reboot. I'm not gonna have it reboot when it's finished because I'm gonna do a couple other things while this is running. So let me get these uh, windows out of the way. So the main part of group of um, the best practices document and tuning is done down in group policy. There are some things that we recommend with the um, paging file and some other things for performance, I would take a look at those. But I wanted to show you these group policy settings. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use local group policy just because we're in a lab. And if I can type right, gpedit.msc, okay? Uh, so I'm just gonna use local here. Domain policy would be a lot better, particularly if you have multiple servers. But uh, just for us, I'm gonna use local group policy just to keep things simple. And I'm gonna expand this window out and make it pretty big. Uh, because Microsoft really buries these settings down in here. Okay, and, and all this is in our documentation and that best practices guide, so you don't have to memorize this or anything like that. But if you go to expand computer configuration and then I expand the administrative templates, then I'll expand Windows components, 
And then I'm going to scroll down here to the remote desktop services and expand that. And then I will expand the remote desktop session host. And finally, I will click on remote session environment. So like I said, they do bury it down here. And then I'll click on standard so we can view this better. And then right here in the middle, it says use advanced remote effects graphics for remote apps. So I'll double click on this and let me pull this over into the middle so we can see it. Okay, I want to enable this and then I'm going to go ahead and click on next setting. Notice that when I do that, it goes ahead and enables it. So I don't have to click apply and okay after every, every time I do this. You can just enable it and click next setting. Uh, these two settings are for GPUs. So if you're using GPUs, um, you can turn these on. We have a document about using GPUs with Hyper-V that you can take a look at. Um, it won't hurt anything because as you can see, it will attempt only for RemoteFX vGPU virtual machines, but they're there. So we can go ahead and just turn them on just in case. But next setting, uh, configure compression for RemoteFX data. Yeah, I really want this on and I wanna change this compression algorithm to use less network bandwidth. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click next setting. Configure the image quality for remote FX adaptive graphics. I will enable this. Lossless is the default in server 2019. That's really, really high. You very rarely would you want to do this. In fact, it is so high, I'm going to set it to medium, that certain down-level clients and non-Windows clients won't even be able to connect. They just can't support that kind of resolution. So if you're connecting from a Mac or Chromebook or Linux OS or something like that, you won't even be able to set it to lossless. Medium is best, and it's our recommendation for a general all-purpose workloads. If you have a specific situation where you just need a little bit higher resolution, you can play around with the other two if you'd like, but it is going to hurt your performance both over the network and um, on the server itself. Okay, so medium is pretty good for all around. Next setting, uh, enable remote effects downloading or for clients 2008. Essentially, this is down-level Windows clients. We're going to use an older version of Remote Effects for them so they can take advantage of some of the features of Remote Effects, even though they won't get quite the latest and greatest. So I'll enable that and click Next Setting. Configure Remote Effects Adaptive Graphics. I will also enable this, and I will change the RDP experience to let the system choose the experience for the network condition. So it'll kind of up and down their experience as the network improves or gets worse, I guess, as things happen throughout the day, but at least they'll be on and continue working. So it'll adapt that as we go along. And then I'll go ahead and click on next setting, start a program on connection. I don't really care about that as far as parallels is concerned. So I'm gonna close out. I'll just click okay and close it. And notice that all of these are enabled and I never clicked apply and I only clicked okay once. Next, I wanna go into this folder that says remote effects for Windows Server 2008 R2. That was the minimum server version that supports uh, remote effects. Windows 7 Service Pack 2, I think, maybe it's Service Pack 1, is the earliest version of Windows workstation that supports remote effects. For non Windows clients, we have licensed the remote effects for Microsoft and we built that technology into the clients as well. So, or for the non Windows clients, you can still take advantage of this even if you're don't, not using Windows based workstations. Okay, the very first one was enabled because we set that already for 2008 R2 and earlier, but I want to go ahead and enable these other two. So I'll go into the optimize uh, the visual experience when using remote effects. I want to click enabled for that. And again, the screen capture rate and quality medium is usually the best for all around uh, workloads, general workloads. And then the next setting, optimize the visual experience for remote effects or remote desktop service sessions, enable this. Rich multimedia is what we want because as you can see, the other option is text. We like working in a little more than text nowadays. So rich multimedia it is, and then I'll go ahead and click okay. All right, that's done. Next, I wanna move up to a, a few lines to device and resource redirection over here on the left-hand pane. And then I'm gonna turn on the first three. So let me double click this. I'll drag the window over and allow audio and video playback redirection. Yep, I'm gonna turn that on. If you don't have any use whatsoever for this, and never will, I guess you don't have to do this, but generally I usually turn that on. Uh, video and audio, allow audio recording. That's if you want to record audio, if you're gonna run like a soft phone, you don't have a mic that you want to redirect, you'll definitely need that on. I'll go to next setting. And limit the audio playback quality. Yeah, I'd want to do that. Set it to dynamic. That's usually the best. That way it'll kind of up and down based on the system configuration or the network conditions, etc. So do that. 
And then that's it for those three, and I'll go ahead and click OK. The other one that we usually recommend turning on is here, Allow Time Zone Redirection at the bottom. That way when users are looking at it, I'll go ahead and enable this, they'll get it in their own time zone and not whatever the server happens to be in. So I'll go ahead and click OK there. All right, the last piece down here is up a notch under the Remote Desktop Connection Client and RemoteFX USB Redirection. If they want to plug in a USB type device, um, I would recommend, well, you have to do this, so enable this, and not just for administrators, but for administrators and users, and then I can click OK here. I almost always turn this on. What this does is it allows the potential to plug in a USB device. Once that's available, I can use RAS policies to determine if an end user can or can't. But if it's on, at least there's the potential to do that. You know, hey, I'm an admin. Maybe I want to do that for myself. Okay, so that's it for all the best practices. But one other thing I wanted to show you in here is the licensing. Um, remember, if you have a license server somewhere, Microsoft documentation will say, oh, okay, now we've got to point the remote desktop servers to the licensing server. How do you do that? You click on start and you go into their management programs. Well, you're going to click on start and go into the management programs and they're not there because Microsoft changed them so they don't get installed with the basic role. You don't have to install the connection broker role. Well, I really don't want to do that because it, I don't need it. It just adds extra complexity and whatever to the server. So how do I do that without it? Right here, I just go into licensing in the side this group policy. So if you follow our best practices, it'll take you down to the session environment the USB redirection, the device and resource redirection, it's right into the spot so you'll see the licensing. And then in here I can um, specify where my license server is and I also can um, change whether it's uh, this one of these settings lets you, oh here's the licensing mode, yeah it lets you change whether it's per device or per user. I'm not going to configure any of these. When you install remote desktop services, Microsoft generously gives you 120 days to try it out. That's more than long enough for us to get through this lab. So I don't need to turn that on. So we're all done here. I will close out of this. Okay, and then while we let this desktop reboot because of the uh, remote desktop services installation, let's go ahead and switch over to the other system where we'll do the install. Okay, this is the server I'm gonna do the install on. And the first thing I wanted to show you is just the doc or the uh, software that you can download. So if you go to our installation page, again, version 18 is the one we're currently on. You can install back level if you need to. Um, as far as what's supported, but this is really what we need. So if I go into the change log, I can see what the older versions were. I also can get the Parallels um, installation, the client files here for the different operating systems directly if I want. Uh, I'm just going to download it using the HTML5 interface. I'll show you how to do that. And then here's the optional components. So here's the RAS reporting service. Here's the performance monitor. There's a plugin now for the report performance monitor to let you view that in the console. And here's where I can get the different flavors of the HALB load balancer. Uh, primarily, it is supported fully on Hyper-V and on VMware vSphere. We also have a VMDK format. You can run the HALB on pretty much any hypervisor. We will provide support for it, but the support goes into, I guess, best effort. Um, as opposed to kind of a guarantee that it'll run on the other ones. It'll run on pretty much any hypervisor, to be honest with you. Um, but that's kind of where the support level is. Okay, so that's that part. Let's actually get installing here. So I've already gone ahead and downloaded this, so I'm just gonna run the main RAS installer right over here. Just double click and run it. And then I'm almost gonna take the defaults. So I'll just go ahead and click next. Always agree the license agreement, right? Click next, I'm not gonna change the directory. Um, I could just click next and install it and it'll add those core components like I talked about. The tenant broker, that's for the advanced training, so let's not worry about that here. I am gonna select custom just so you can see what's installed. Okay, so I'll do custom and next, and then you can see that the publishing agent, the gateway, and the remote desktop session host agent are getting installed. That's really all you need. The Parallels console is a standalone, that's the management console, that's standalone. It'll run on pretty much any Windows system, including Windows workstations. So you could put that there, um, but it gets installed by default on the server. 
We also have the Parallels RAS PowerShell interface. Uh, if you want to use PowerShell commands, you can do so programmatically. It's beyond the scope of this training today to get into PowerShell, but it's there. Um, and their documentation is online if you'd like to do that. And the one thing I am going to install is the web administration service. So I want to show you the new uh, the web admin console. So that's the only one I'm going to change. The rest of this, these other agents, the guest agent, PC agent, um, those are guest agents for VDI or remote PC. And the enrollment service, that's a whole thing under SAML, which again, we'll get into in the advanced training. So that was it. I pretty much took the defaults. I just added the web administration service. So I'll go ahead and click next. Okay, right here, this is a warning on the gateway component itself about port conflicts. It's telling me that port 3389 is in use. Well, yes, I've already peed into the system, so that's why it's in use. If I had other port conflicts up here, like port 443 or 80, usually it's because IIS is installed on the server. That's the main culprit. Uh, other programs, however, might use those ports. If you see a warning up here, go ahead and proceed with the installation. We can clean it up after the fact. Uh, but if it is because of IAS and you're not using IAS, I would recommend removing IAS because we certainly don't need it. If you need it on your stuff, go ahead and install it. You just probably will have a port conflict. You can always adjust our ports or change the other ports later on. But I go ahead and do the installation. You don't have to break out necessarily. Okay, I'll go ahead and do next. These are those firewall rules I was talking about. These are the ones that are gonna get added automatically on the server. You can see this little checkbox here if you don't want to have that to happen. But I do recommend, um, I like shortcuts and letting things happen automatically because it's less work for me. So I'll go ahead and click next. And uh, the single sign-on component, this has nothing to do, by the way, with the end users. This has to do with single sign-on into the Parallels Remote Application Server Management Console. All right, single sign-on for the end users is very different. This is just single sign-on into the console. It's kind of fun to turn that on. I usually, to be honest with you, I'm fine with just the checkbox, remember my password, and that's good enough. I'm not gonna do it here because it does require reboot of the system and I don't need any more reboots. So I'll just go ahead and leave it off and click next. And then here's my screen. We're actually gonna kick off the install. So go ahead and click next. And this doesn't take terribly long to complete. So we'll just go ahead and let this run. And once that green bar gets across, uh, we'll be up and running. Okay. And then the next step, it's going to have us actually launch right into the program itself. So very, very quick to do the installation. Okay. There we go. That's it. It's done. It's installed. And it's actually almost ready to go. We don't have terribly much more to do. Uh, this little checkbox here, launch the remote application server console, that's going to go ahead and put me into it. Once in a blue moon, somebody clicks finish and nothing happens and they want to know what happened. I think what happens is they accidentally uncheck that. And then when they click finish, they see this and they're like, did the product install or what? Hmm? Yes, it installed. It's there. If that happens to you, just go into the start menu. Here's the remote application server console. Since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and pin it to my taskbar so I can get into it. So if that happens, just go to the start menu and launch it, and then that will take you to the next step, which is right here. Now I'm logging into the farm. The farm name, by default, is the host name of my server. I can change it later if I want, but that's what it is. Since I'm on the server itself, I can just use local host, and I'll just, as a friendly name, call it my farm. Now the username and password. I am creating the first administrator user here. Okay, now it needs to be a valid Windows account, and then whatever account I use is going to be my first admin. I can add more admins later, I can take admins away and all that, but this is going to be the first administrator account. It needs to have at least administrator privileges on the server. Preferably, it would be joined to the domain. Now, I'm just going to use a um, domain account as the domain admin. You don't have to be a domain admin, but you do have to be an administrator on the server but I'm just gonna use a domain admin because he's, it's both. All right, there's my password. Hopefully I typed that in right and I'll click remember credentials so I don't have to do with it. This edit connections button, I'd really rather not have to go in there. What that's for is if you rename your server or change the IP address, you'll be spending some time in here trying to, trying to recover. Support can help you with that if nothing else. But it's best again to get all that set up front so you don't have to deal with it. Okay, go ahead and click connect and it's going to go ahead and log me in. Now it's going to ask me to register, right? I need to activate Parallels. 
So if you don't have a Parallels My Account already, I can just click on the register button here and then I can fill this out and create one on the fly. I'm not going to do that. I happen to have an account already, so I'm just going to use that and log in. And hopefully I remember my password. So I'll go ahead and click sign in. Hey, look at that, it's good. So if you've got a license key, you can go ahead and plug that in here. I'm just gonna go ahead and activate a trial version. We have 30 days on the trial to um, work with this. It's not crippled in any way. The software is completely 100% fully functional, except for you only get 30 days on a trial and you only get 50 users. Um, but this, by the way, is an excellent way if you wanna set up a lab. You can just activate a trial version and kind of test it out and get through the lab and the training and the certification and you're all good. So I'm gonna go ahead and activate a trial version. I'll click activate. It's gonna go out over the internet and talk to the RAS servers. You can activate offline if you need to, but we need to do some work with supporter sales, but I'm on the internet, so it's good. So the product activated successfully. I will click okay. And then it's gonna launch me right into the Parallels Remote Application Server console. This is telling me that I don't have a remote desktop server or anything like that available yet. So effectively, remember I said a site needs to have all the components, a publishing agent, a gateway, and a remote desktop server, or a VDI a guest, or a remote PC. Well, I don't have that yet, so I'll just go ahead and click OK. All right, let me expand this out a bit um, for us so we can see a little bit better. Okay, so it starts with start. I could just work my way down the wizard here. I could deploy Windows Virtual Desktop. I could click Add Remote Desktop Session Host. Then I would publish applications. And then I can use an email function to invite users. Uh, this Windows Virtual Desktop, or WVD, we're gonna put that in the advanced training. So uh, tune into the advanced training if you wanna see information about that. But for right here, I'm just gonna go ahead and um, do this. Now I could do this here, but I want to actually get into the guts of the program first since we're doing training a little bit. All these icons up and down the left hand side, those are the main menu system. So instead of putting it across the top, we put them up and down the side. The documentation will call those categories actually. But if I go to farm and then, um, and then I go to site, here's my little dashboard and you can see there's my publishing agent and there's my gateway, green, green, we're all happy. If I had a port conflict on port 80 or 443, the gateway would show up right here, and then I could resolve that here if I needed to. But for now, let's go ahead and get this functional. So what we're missing is I was gonna turn this into a remote desktop server. So under farm, I'm gonna click on remote desktop session host. And then here's my little blue plus. These little blue pluses are hidden all over the place. They are our action buttons. So when you come to a screen, look for those. I'm gonna add a remote desktop session host. So I'll go ahead and add it. If I had one out here that was available, it would search and find one for me, but I don't think I do. So I'm gonna just point to this server, which is RAS cert. If I can type dash O1, and then I'll click the little green button here and it'll come up and tell me that it's okay. Why is it okay? Well, I pre-installed the remote desktop session host role so we can get through the reboot on it. And when I did the RAS installation, it installed the agent for me. So it should be okay. All I'm really doing is tying what the components are already on here to the server at this point for this one particular server. So I'll just go ahead and click next and next and next. I'll, I'll walk you through what some of these are when I add a remote desktop server uh, for real uh, or another one. I'll just go next. These are some optimization stuff that we set in. Like I said, when I add it, uh, when we do the second one, I'll go through this. So I'll just go to next and actually it is doing some of the optimizations for me and it'll be done in just a moment here. Okay, so that finished. I'll go ahead and click done and finish. And then we always click apply and then that's it. It should be online. I can click this little refresh here a couple of times as the service gets started and comes online. Logon's disabled and it'll be up in a moment. That's just finishing up those optimizations. Okay, there we go, green, green, everything's online. And if I go back up to site here under farm, we can see that the entire environment is now online. Let's go ahead and get using this. We can go ahead and start actually publishing applications. So I can just click on the publishing category over here. And then here's our little blue plus down at the bottom. I can click add. 
And from here you can see we can actually publish a wide variety of things, applications and desktops from Windows, uh, an AppV um, application, web apps, document, kind of like a file share. I can publish a, just a document via um, Parallels for as a folder path UNC, using UNC. Uh, but for right now, let's just go ahead and publish a doc, uh, an application. I'll go next. It's a remote desktop session host. I will go next and choose installed applications. The difference with installed applications is it lets me browse to find the application uh, using the Windows, um, essentially the start menu. It's been registered with Windows. I don't have to uh, go hunt down the executable. And then all servers in a site, sure, for what we're doing here. And so this is where it browse the Windows inventory and it comes up and I'll grab a few things. Everybody needs Chrome, um, accessories, how about calculator, paint, and oh, there's WordPad. Everybody needs mission critical apps like those. And then I'll just go ahead and click uh, next and next and finish and then I'll click apply. And that's it. System's actually ready to be used. So let's go ahead and open up our browser here. I'll go back to uh, Chrome. And if I just type in HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash, um, and then the host name of the server, razzert dash 01, and hit enter, it's gonna take me to the HTML5 web interface. This is because I'm still running on a self-signed certificate. I haven't replaced the certs yet, right? So I'm just going to go advanced and proceed right through. Yes, I know it's unsafe, but it's my own server. Here we go. All right? Yeah, these are Google things. I'll accept cookies. Um, and then I can go ahead and log in. And one of the things that I did uh, when I was clicking through the wizard is we already added authenticated users to the remote desktop uh, users group on this server. So any of my domain users should be able to work. So I can log in as somebody like, I don't know, here's Mae West. Okay, so I'll do that. Um, by the way, if you're going to log into a domain, May West uh, at, we use the UAC format. Um, that's the name of my domain. That's the format you would use. You wouldn't use the old net BIOS name domain backslash, right? Use this format. However, because there's not a local username May West, it's not ambiguous. It always knows it's the domain. So I don't actually have to type that in as long as it's not a local user. If I use the administrator, it doesn't know if I'm using local or uh, the domain admin. It would probably attempt to use the local, but because there's no local username Mae West, I can just call that. So I'll just go ahead and log in. And there she goes. All right, now it's gonna prompt me to download the Parallels client. I don't have to do this. I could just run it completely within the browser, but I wanna show you the experience. You can see the applications I've published are already up there and they're accessible. So just that quick, we're ready to go and ready to run. All right, so the Parallels client, let me walk you through this and then I'll show you the differences. I'm gonna go ahead and install it. This is gonna feel like a browser plugin to the end user and then download. It's not a browser plugin, but it's gonna feel like it. Okay, now that it's downloaded, I just run it and then I literally can take the defaults. I'm not even gonna go into custom to show you what's going on in this one. I'll just go next, agree, next, next, install. Okay. The very last screen, it's gonna have a checkbox asking me to launch the Parallels client. I don't even have to do that because there's, no there's no configuration in the client whatsoever. I'll show you about that in a minute. So I'm just gonna uncheck that and click finish and then I will just close this little pop-up window. Uh, this is a Google browser thing. There's no way around that. It's saying, hey, the, um, you're calling an external program, so you're gonna have to click OK if you wanna do that. Okay, now that that's done, let's go ahead and launch some applications. Um, I don't know, we'll start with WordPad, it's right here. So I could launch them with the client since we've done the installation, but I wanna show you the client list option first. So if I just right click on an application, because I installed the client, I have a choice between running it with the client and opening it in HTML5 only. Let's go ahead and do the bottom one. This is the client list version. So it's gonna go ahead and log me in, start the session, and then in just a moment, WordPad will pop up here. There it is, All right, I can, drag it and move it around. Here's WordPad. Notice a couple of things about WordPad though. It's fully functional. It's WordPad or any application I happen to install, but it's running in the system tray of the browser, if you will, the browser's tray, not down to the Windows taskbar. Okay, so I am limited to the browser. 
Um, it is fully functional. I can do things here uh, that you can do WordPad like stuff. Uh, one thing I can do is, you know, type of course, but if I go to file and print, printing already is available, local printing, right? So if I wasn't connecting from a server to itself, but I was on my workstation, I could just go file, print, pick 2x universal printer, and it would come out in the print job would come out whatever the default printer is on my workstation. Didn't do anything as an administrator to configure this. It works just right out of the box. So local printing already is set. Uh, there are some limitations to this. One of them is full screen, right? I um, Or multi-monitor, rather. I'm running in a web browser. I can't only run on one screen. I suppose I could stretch the web browser across two screens and then put an app on one and an app on the other. But that's about the uh, limit of what I could do here. I also can't um, interact directly with the local hard disk or my hard drive or my local system. If I went to file save as, you know, I can see on this PC, I can see C drive and all that. And I've got a couple of map drives that happen because of my login on the network that I've set, but I don't see my local drives on here. So that's limited as well. Um, scanning also can't work through this, but like I said, I can run the application, I can do print, uh, there also, by the way, is this little chevron down here. This is an upload and download function. So if I was to click download, I actually could go find a file on the server that I had access to, um, such as, uh, you know, whatever's in my profile. I don't really have anything because it's a brand new user. It's not the administrator, which is why I obviously, I can't see the administrator's desktop. That's why I don't see all these applications up here. But if I was to find a file here and click OK, open and download, it actually would download it and then it would put it onto my downloads directory on my local system that I have access to. Okay, so I can use the transfer file up and down uh, using the browser. So it's possible to transfer files. I can also turn that off, by the way, for security purposes. I just can't interact as seamlessly. Uh, the other thing in here too is a clipboard. This allows me to copy uh, small amounts of text back and forth um, and items going through here. If I want to multitask, I can certainly do that. You know, uh, what good is WordPad without calculator? So I'll just go ahead and launch calculator and there we go. Now I can run calculator and WordPad, switch back and forth and whatever else I have to. I can launch Chrome and do a browser in a browser. So very, very powerful um, for something that is so highly convenient, but it is missing, like I said, a few bells and whistles, but I can get those bells and whistles by using the client. So let me close these applications out don't need to save my um, fancy text here or anything. And now I'm going to switch modes. So let's go ahead and launch, um, well, heck, let's go launch Paint. I haven't launched that yet. I can either right click and select the client or I can just double click because it's the default. It's going to give me a self-signed certificate warning again, but that again is because that's what I'm running on the uh, server. I'll go ahead and connect through that. And this other one is a disconnect reconnect message that's behind it. Um, that's because I switched modes from HTML5 to uh, the clientless mode. Well, here's Paint, right? How exciting is that? But look what's different about uh, Paint on this as I drag the corners of this and move it around. Paint is now in here in the taskbar. It's not in the browser, so it's a seamless window. And I can see that I've got the little Parallels Double Hot Dog logo running on the icon down there. That lets an end user know that it is the server version of the application and not the local version. So if I was using a secure browser like IE to get to an app that required a certain browser level, uh, that would help my end users not get confused between the IE on the local Windows workstation and the IE on the server. All right. So. But it broke it out, it's seamless, so I can minimize it. You can see it goes down in the taskbar. Let me close out this little window here, and I'll go ahead and close the browser and close the uh, management console and the uh, file explorer here. But there's Paint, so it's seamless. So what's cool about this is I now have the look and feel of the HTML5 web interface, but I've got the power of the client behind it. So I can do multi-monitor. I can put one app on one screen, one on another. If I was doing the full desktop experience, I would end up with multiple discrete screens to match my browsers. If I go to file and print, this is going to be very exciting because I'm on the server. Um, I've only got the PDF thing here, but notice instead of 2x universal printer, it calls out uh, the actual printer by my username. 
So that clues in your users that it's a local printer and not one attached to the server. But if I had multiple printers defined on my workstation, I now could pick and choose between the two or three or four or however many I had defined. I wouldn't have to just print to the default printer. Uh, scanning will work on this. Um, the other one is if I went to file save as, I believe this is on by default. I didn't set any policies. There it is. So I can see the drives on the server. And, and again, these are only the drives in the areas that I have access to. I probably couldn't actually save a file to the uh, C root of C because I wouldn't have permissions as just a user, but I can browse that. But here's the files that are actually mapped on my workstation. So I've got, just like an RDP window, I've got a more seamless experience about being able to uh, transfer those you know, files up and down uh, using the browser experience here, or at least the file explorer experience. And again, of course, I can turn all those off and on using RAS policies if I'd like to. Okay, and I can configure scanners and a bunch of other bells and whistles that would work through this as well. Let me go ahead and minimize that, and then I'm going to go back into the browser here. One of the things I want to show you, there's this little star here, which I can set um, favorites. So if I clicked on like, you know, paint, of course, is my favorite. You can see I can hover it over it and click the star. And now when I click on the star, hey, paint shows up down here. So if you've got a lot of applications, a user can make that happen very quickly. And this also, this little button here will minimize all the windows so I can quickly get back to just the, the screen if I've got a whole lot of stuff going on. Uh, this little user icon up in the top right is a menu. So I can click up here, I can see who I am, I can get about. There's some settings in here that I can do. I can change my domain password. I can't make this go away, but if you don't want people changing passwords, you can stop them from doing it at the domain level. They click change password, they get a um, um, an access denied or a denial message, the Windows message if they try to do it. Uh, I can redetect the Parallels client. Um, and then this is actually pretty cool. I can go to download the Parallels client if I change my mind and didn't do it the first time. So I can download the client. Notice though, since I already have the client installed, I get a download, but I also have a configure button. So if I go ahead and click configure, it'll launch the client. And then it's got administrator because that's who I'm logged in as a Windows, but um, to this Windows session, but I can log in as Mae West again and connect. And then here's the client experience. So there's that. Uh, here's a little refresh. I can do that. And there, there's my applications. So this provides the same type of experience once I launched an application as launching Paint does here, and just using the client directly instead of the browser. So you get the browser only. I have the client integrated with the browser, or I could do the client directly. And what does the client give you? Well, the client gives us a couple of things other than this look and feel, but I can do things such as right click and uh, create shortcuts on the desktop. So now I can, you know, just launch applications from the desktop. Here's Chrome, WordPad, Paint, and then uh, put calculator up here above all my other clutter. Um, I can get rid of those if I want, but right click and delete. Uh, you can program or use the Parallels remote application server, by the way, to add those items to the start menu too. So then I could just browse them using the start menu if I wanted. Uh, there's a bunch of other controls here I can do, tools, options. If you wanted to configure single sign-on for the client, this is where you would do it. Click that. It does require a reboot of the workstation. But then they'll go ahead, once they're logged into Windows, assuming Windows is joined to the domain, they will then just automatically be logged into Parallels. So if you turn on single sign-on and you did something like shortcuts on the desktop and just have end users launching it from here, that's about as seamless as a remote application will get. Okay. That, that's about it. Okay, so that's enough of the client. Oh, one last thing real quick. We're almost ready for a break here. Hang on. Um, I can right click and go to connection properties. And there's all sorts of settings in here that I can change. Um, gateway mode just means I'm tunneling through the gateway. Um, and I'm using SSL. Obviously, we're 443, so if I'd switched it to a different port, like 444 or 4040 or so, I'd have to do that here. I can configure a secondary connection with the client, so if I'm at home and I need to connect to a different address, I can plug that in versus at work, or I would use a work internal address. That would be more seamless to the end users because I have two different connections. Um, but you can change all sorts of settings in here, local resources. You know, this is where, as a user, I can turn off and on um, you know, peripherals, local disk drives. I can configure my multi-monitor settings in here. 
um, use primary monitor only, all sorts of things. Most users wouldn't get into this, but one of the really cool things is remember all these settings. I can control these centrally from parallels from the console. So if I did that, then I could prevent users from changing these. So I can make all these decisions centrally for my end users, and I can choose which end users get which permissions and which don't. Okay, so I can turn off local drives, I can turn off printing, scanning, I could do all sorts of things like that. But um, we'll look at these a little bit closer when I get into the uh, policies piece. All right, with that, let's go ahead and take a break. So I'm gonna put up the timer here and we'll do a, um, let's do a 15 minute break. So I'll go ahead and get that started. Okay, have a great break everybody.
Okay, welcome back everybody. Hope you had a good break. Uh, we've got about an hour and 15 minutes left, so we've still got a lot to cover, but we'll get there. So I'm going to move pretty quickly. Okay, so just a quick recap of what we did before the break. We uh, installed Parallels Remote Application Server using best practices. Uh, we published some applications, and then we accessed the server over the, uh, using three different methods. The HTML5 clientless mode, the HTML5 interface with the um, client integrated into it, and then of course with the client directly. So we've seen all three of those. So effectively what we have here is a fully functional server running all three components, the publishing agent, the gateway, and the remote desktop server. Let's go ahead and work on scaling this out and we'll deploy our second all-in-one server. So to do that, I'll just go down to farm and publishing agents. That's usually the first component that we want to deploy a second one of. And I'll click on our little blue plus up here in the top right. And then I'll type in a their server name here and hope I don't fat finger the password. I'll find out real quick when I click resolve. Hey, it, or the host name. Went ahead and resolved to an address. Um, just to show you what we're doing, we're obviously deploying a publishing agent. Uh, this little checkbox here will install a gateway as well, so that will take care of that component, so I don't have to do that separately unless I was deploying a gateway to its own servers, in which case you might want to uncheck this box. The gateway also I will enable the HTML5 interface on that. And then here's the Windows firewall rules. I have the firewall turned off on the target server so that I can push this over there. Once it's done, I could just turn the firewall on on that server, the Windows firewall on if I want, because as long as this is checked, we're going to add in the firewall rules for us. I'll go ahead and click Next and get this rolling. It's going to go out there, it's going to check, and it will come back and tell me that, hey, there's no agent on there, which I know. So once that's done, I will go ahead and click Install. Okay, so it was able to copy the uh, installer over to that other server, and then it's going to run it locally over there, and that's what's happening. And it's going to put on the publishing agent and the gateway at the same time. Okay, and that finished successfully, so I'll go ahead and click Done, and then I'll click, um, it's syncing the servers, I'll click OK, and then we always click Apply, as you can see it says Not Applied, and then I'll go ahead and sync up. It says Not Verified, it's just taking a moment to uh, sync up the internal database. So again, there's internal database, I don't have to do um, anything fancy there. There's a little refresh button up here in the top right, if I click on this, there we go, it's online. So just like that, that's all it takes to deploy a second server. I've got the primary, remember that does 60% of the work and it's the licensing server, that's the one we're on. The secondary server will do 40% of the work. They're both there, they're active active. If I right click on the secondary server, I can promote it to primary. It will prompt me to do the reactivation of the product again using my Parallels My Account because we're obviously changing the host name and the MAC address, which is what the license is tied to. So it'll ask me that My Account password, so don't forget that. But that's really all you have to do to promote it. So if the you can do this for migrations, whatever you like. I can have a third one if I'd like, or a fourth one. We do recommend that you put those in standby mode if you do that. So to do that, you just would right click, go to properties, and then um, right here is the little standby button, the checkbox. So if I check that, that'll have it active, active, passive, or active, passive if I just have the two of them. So that's really all that I, I would need to do there um, for that. So that's pretty much it. For the uh, gateways, um, if I go to farm and then go over here to gateways, you can see it deployed a secondary gateway as well. Um, that's really it. Um, it's already up and running. And if I go and look at the properties of the gateways, you'll notice um, that a lot of these settings I can migrate or I can set just as once. This is the IP addressing, so obviously that would be unique. But if I was to look at the network and the SSL and the HTML5, you'll see that it has this inerit defaults and then a site default setting. So if I uncheck this box, I can have different gateways with different sets of properties. If I want them all to do the same thing, I would click on site defaults to edit those, and then those will apply to all gateways, so just in one spot. But here's where you could do things such as, I'll uncheck this just briefly so you can see what's going on, but I could do um, change the port from port 80 to port 81 or something like that. And the same thing with SSL, I could switch it from a different port here from to 444, 4040, whatever I wanted. If for some reason I need a secure port, um, I'll get into certificates in just a moment. HTML5, um, it is on by default. As you can see, it's enabled by default. This little drop down box here allows me to pick and choose how the end users, what they get. 
So by default, uh, you're in that option mode, right? Where you can right click and choose the client or choose the HTML5 only interface. If you just double click, the default is the client. Um, but if the client's not present, it will use that. But I can force them to go one way or the other. I can be like, you know, I don't want them installing anything on their client systems, HTML5 only. They will never see that prompt to download the client. They'll just log in and go. Or perhaps you're in a situation where they need the power of the client. They need uh, local peripheral, local USB access. They need multiple monitors. And you just go ahead and force them to do the client up front so you don't have to worry about that. So you can do all sorts of things here. Um, this is one spot where you can turn off that file transfer and the clipboard command here. I can also do that in policies, but I can do it here as well, which would stop them from transferring things off the server or the VDI instance or whatever. Okay, so let me go ahead and cancel this um, so I don't save my default settings there. Uh, the next thing we'll do, let's go ahead and deploy the load balancers and get that in place. So under farm, halb, high availability load balancer, that's that acronym that's kind of awkward, but at least it's descriptive. We've changed this a little bit um, from how it looked in the past, so this is a little bit different. But here's my action button. I click on the blue plus, and then it launches a little wizard. And I can just name this um, HALB1. And I can give it a description if you want. Here's the virtual IP address. Uh, I think I think dot 40 is open. I'll put it there. And then there's the subnet mask. If, you, if I had IPv6 running in my environment, I could do that. And then I wanted to load balance both the port 80 connections, that's this checkbox, and the port uh, 443 connections, which is this one. I'm not going to bother doing any client management through this. I'll touch briefly on client management um, in a moment, but I'm not going to do that, so I'll leave that port unchecked. I'll go ahead and click Next. Um, this pops up because I can see my port 80. So I could either check one or both halbs. If I only check one, I'm not going to be doing any load balancing. And then I could change the halb port here. Uh, the next one will be um, the SSL ports. So if I want to change port 443 or 444, I could just change that there for the load balancer, but I can also just check, check both load balances. Uh, the mode here, pass through or SSL offloading, where do you want the SSL certificates to get de-encrypted? Uh, almost everybody just leaves it a pass through and we let the gateway handle the de-encryption but you could have the load balancers do it right here if you go to SSL offloading, but then you'd have to configure those settings here. So let's not worry about that. I'm just gonna leave it at the defaults, then I'll go next. And the next question is um, the devices. What load balancers do I wanna use? So I'll click on my little blue plus, and I have a couple here that um, you can see I've got a bunch that are already in use. Here's one that's available. I could go ahead and add both of them here simultaneously right? There's the first one. I could add the second one, but I'm not. I want to show you that we can actually have two different discrete load balancers here in this environment. So then I'll just click on finish and then apply. And then it will refresh and now it's online. That's it. So we're all good. Okay. That's all it takes to use the load balancer. I now can connect using um, that load balancer address. I could just simply come up here and go to um, uh, oops, what did I put that on? Dot 40, right? Dot 40. And go right through. And then it will load balance it. That's it, right? I'm actually already using the load balancer. A newer feature that we have in version 18 and later is I can have a second discrete set of load balancers. So I could just run through this whole thing and go on um, HALB2. And then I, I have to give it a different virtual IP address. I think 49 is open. I'm still on the same class C based subnet and I'll payload the same things uh, or load balance the same thing. So check, 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 check. I can actually have this load balancing different sets by the way. So right now I'm just having two different entry points in my load balancer that load balance the same uh, gateways, but I could have one set to go to one and one set to go to number two, however I wanted to do that. Next, and then I just simply add in the other uh, load balancer that I have available, which is 4.4. And then I would click finish. And now I could connect through the load balancer either over the virtual IP address on 40 or on 49. All right, and this will verify in a second. What does the load balancer look like? Let me switch screens real quick and I'll flip over here. Um, it's actually running in a vSphere environment. It'll run on pretty much everything. Here it is. Uh, in vSphere, I just imported it as a deploy an OVF template. Um, Hyper-V uses the VHD templates. Um, 
have them in both formats. And then I imported it the second time for this one, but I just imported it, then I turned it on, went to the virtual console, and then I used this menu here, this little um, arrow key keyboard menu, to configure the IP address. And you can see it's answering right now to dot .43. It's actually running and fully configured, even though it says not configured, it just the screen doesn't refresh because it's a little virtual appliance. So if I just go into the advanced menu, and then I could change all sorts of settings here, including reboot, reset, would reset it back to uh, the defaults. It would leave the networking, but it would disassociate it from um, this RAS farm. But then when I go back, now you can see all my services are running, 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 and you can see it's got two IP addresses in there, right? Control Alt, so I can get out of that little mouse trap that VMware has. But dot .43, and then the virtual IP address dot .40, so it can answer to either one. Okay? So that's pretty much it for the load balancers, and that's how that works. Uh, the one other thing I want to get into here real quick uh, is certificates. We've centralized the certificate use. Back in the day, you did have to go into each gateway or load balancer and configure the certificates individually. Here, I can do it all in a centralized place. Now, the product ships with a self-signed certificate. That's what I've been using. That's why we see all the warning, warning, the sky is falling, blah, blah, blah makes it very convenient for testing, but for production, I would like to use a proper certificate. So the way to do that is I go up here to the blue plus, and I say import, um, I could generate a certificate request, actually. I, if I need to regenerate the self-sign, that's what I do there. But I would generate a CSR, I would fill out all this information, that would give me a little, um, a little stub or whatever it is that I need to send over to my proper certificate authority, such as GoDaddy, DigiCert, whoever I'm using, and then it will, um, they'll go through the ether and then they'll send me back the actual certificate. Yes, we can use wildcard certs as well. And then what I would do is come in here and say import certificate, and then I would import it. And I would say, what do I want to apply it to? The gateways, the load balancers, whatever. And if I have different certificates for different environments, I could actually go back into the gateway properties and pick this certificate for that and this certificate for this or whatever, I mean, however you want to get into it. But that's really all I have to do. Uh, one thing I do want to show you that's kind of important though is what certificates we do support. Let me minimize this. The easiest way is to go on a system where the Parallels client is there. And if I just go into File Explorer, and then I go down to the uh, C drive, and then program files, and then um, parallels, and the client. There's a file in here called trusted.pem. There it is, trusted.pem. If I go open this with um, Notepad, it's just a text file. <sighs> and make this difficult. There we go, Notepad. <laughs> it used to be so easy. This is all the thumbprints of all the um, certificates that we promote or, or support, and it's a huge file, right? So if you're going to buy one, you might want to check this file, that trusted.pem file. It's just on a system where the client is, and then I could do like, um, I don't know, GoDaddy. There's GoDaddy right here. I know they're there. Um, DigiCert would be in here. There's a whole ton. So just double check. Every so often someone finds a freeware or some funky one and it's just it's not in here and we don't support it. So it has to be a proper certificate that we support. It is a thumbprint. It's a text file. So you could use whatever certificate you want and import this into the uh, this file, that thumbprint into this file. Um, that will work. It'll get rid of those warnings. You now have a properly trusted certificate, but because it's not supported, um, you know, if you do a Parallels client update or whatever, and this file gets overwritten for whatever reason because of an update, you'd have to do the whole rigmarole again. So just use one that we support. That's going to be much, much easier for you, and you'll be much happier in the long run. Okay, let's go ahead and get back into the management console. I do want to deploy that second remote desktop server. So to do that, again, I could just come up here to the um, little wizard. Uh, but I'm just going to go farm RD session host and click on the blue plus. It's the same man or same functionality. Click on this, and then I'll point to the server and hope I didn't fat finger the password or the uh, host name again. It looks like it not. We've already got the remote desktop server role on there from earlier, so it's really just deploying an agent that's going to be very similar to what we did before. I'll just click next. Here's a bunch of these little shortcuts and wizards that we're going to do. 
add the Windows firewall rules, the RDSH role, we could do that for you so you wouldn't have to do that manage add roles and features, things like that. The desktop experience, um, we'll turn that on if you're running on an older server. And then of course, if you do the RDSH, it can um, initiate a reboot. And then if you wanna add it to a RAS server group, you could do that right here. This is a RAS group. Um, where you can create a new one on the fly. I'll just take the default RD session host here. I don't have to add it to a group at all if I didn't want. I'll click next. Um, users that access this do have to be members of the local remote desktop users group. Uh, the default is we're just gonna put anybody that authenticates with Active Directory, they can come in here and we'll have access to the server. We can choose who can and can't see what applications, what desktops, whatever. So you can control that all in RAS. This is really just who potentially could log in. And again, that's why Mae West could just log in because I took the defaults of authenticated users uh, when I added that in there. I'll go ahead and click next. Um, this is something that's new um, within Parallels from um, version 18. Do not manage by RAS. This is the user profile settings. User profile disk is kind of the older way that Microsoft had. It's not the oldest way. The oldest way would be roaming user profiles, which is horrible. Uh, that'll probably be with us forever. Please don't use that. But you could use a user profile disk or Microsoft purchased a company called FS Logics um, a year or two ago, and they have a very robust solution and Microsoft gives it away for free. So if you have an Office 365 license, if you've got Microsoft remote desktop client access licenses, which you would do to do terminal service, or, if you're using VDA licenses, you qualify to use FS Logics for free for Microsoft licensing. You can set FS Logics up completely outside of Parallels. The server side, you kind of do have to take advantage of that and get that ready to go. But once it's done, we can actually deploy the location and the type and all these other tip, uh, settings that you can do right here. Um, allocation type, dynamic, the size, where they're located, that would be important and then the additional settings that you want to get in here. I'm not going to go any too far into this. I'm going to leave it at none, um, just so we can kind of get rolling along. But effectively, this gets the user profiles off the server, off the VDI instance, so that they're stored and backed up locally. So that's the anything that a user would save to the desktop, if you're publishing a full desktop, to my documents, downloads, folders, any browser shortcuts or um, bookmarks that they've done, anything like that, all that gets stored in the profile. And you can pick and choose a wealth of things that you want stored and not stored using FS Logics. But that's pretty cool that we can build that in right here. Um, you don't have to go back and do something separate. Then if I go next, this is another set of um, features. These are in optimizations that we kind of look at and can configure. Um, if I enable them and set them to manual, it's gonna do all of these different things. Um, Little tweaks, you can look them all up to see what they are. Um, you can set this. I'm gonna have it not do this at the moment just because I want this to deploy faster since we're here. But that's a very cool set of features. It does not do the group policy settings that we said earlier. I wish it would do those, but that's a little bit beyond what we can do. But it can do all sorts of these other little tuning features that, that you can kind of um, go forth with. All right, so I'll go ahead and click next. This is a summation screen about what's gonna be doing. You see I left the optimization off just so the server would deploy faster for us in the lab. And I'll go ahead and click next and it's the same process. We're just gonna copy the file over, it's actually already over there and it's just gonna run it. Okay, that's it, went ahead and completed. I'll go ahead and click done and finish. And then like I said, we always click, a or click apply to do this and then uh, that just syncs up the the two different databases that we have, and then a couple of refreshes, and there it is, it's online. So now when I go back up to site here, we can see exactly what's going on in the environment. I've got two different load balancers, and I've got two publishing agents, two gateways, and two remote desktop session hosts. Okay, so that's it with the remote desktop servers. We've now built out two all-in-one servers, and we've added the load balancer to it. So we've done our picture. Let's go ahead and move into VDI at the moment. And before we start doing the demo, I wanna back up a little bit to the PowerPoint slides, and we will um, kind of review what I talk about, because VDI can mean different things to different people. We don't think it does, but it does. And there's some different VDI types that Parallels can support. Um, essentially, there's three different types that we support, or at least providing a full desktop, if that's what you consider to be VDI. The one on the left, desktop-based VDI, that's what most people think of when they think of VDI. That means each user has their own, I don't know, Windows 10 image, maybe Windows 7, um, things of that nature. 
There's server-based VDI, which we also support. <laughs> Essentially, that's instead of giving users a workstation class operating system to work off of, they get a server class operating system to work off of. Here's your Windows 2016 server or Windows 2019 server. It's all yours, so that's that. And the other one is one that I think a lot of people don't use or don't think of as much when they talk about VDI, and they really should. It's called session-based VDI. It's a fancy name for just publishing the full desktop on a remote desktop server. Okay, And I want to take you through some of the plus and minuses of, of each of these. The server-based VDI, the main reason to use that is mostly because you either have an, an application that requires a server, or maybe you're training some developers in class or something like that, or there's some weird Microsoft licensing that sometimes comes into play that might make that more attractive from a Microsoft side. From a parallel side, we support all three of these equally, and of course there's no changes to your parallels licensing. So if we think about the characteristics of a shared desktop or a session-based VDI, you just have multiple users logging into the same terminal server. It's the same thing with apps, except we're giving them a full desktop. So it tends to be very efficient, right? Much more efficient than doing VDI. Uh, the traditional VDI, we're using the workstation-based. Uh, you are gonna want to manage the user profiles, but you'd wanna be doing that anyway. I talked about FS Logics earlier for Microsoft. Here's actually a link that provides a little bit more information on the Microsoft side and how to get FS Logics if you just go to that link. Um, but again, you'll have access to the slides and recordings, you can see it, and it's included with the CALs. But you want to do that to keep the user data off of that. And that's even if you're doing application publishing. Uh, there are some limitations. So users can't do things in this environment that affect others. You can't reboot, you can't install applications, you can't do anything like that. But if that's not your requirement, then this is something that you really might want to look at. Because of their profile management, they can change their wallpaper, they can move shortcuts around, they can save stuff to the documents and all of that. So you can do all of that in this type of an environment. Um, and it tends to be like it's a little bit more efficient because you have fewer moving parts. You just have a bunch of users connecting to a few servers as opposed to that one-to-one -one relationship that you'd have with the desktop instances. Okay, And RAS can auto-scale these as well. So we can take advantage of the auto-scaling using uh, these, using essentially the VDI um, mechanics also. And I'll show you how we do that in a moment. From a VDI desktop, um, this is what most people think of with VDI, right? One user, one desktop at a time. Everybody gets their own image, Windows 7, Windows 10, whatever it is you're using. It must be Windows-based. <laughs> I wish we could virtualize and do Mac OS or Linux OS, but we can't. So they have to be Windows workstations. All right, so generally a workstation class OS, although like I said, we do support server-based VDI. Uh, the guest benefits, well, you know, we do the brokering, you get the HTML5 and the other interfaces, different clients, printing, peripherals, all that other stuff that I talked about is applicable here as well. And the best practices, I actually would run that, the remote FX settings that we did inside of the Windows 10 instances. Do that in your group policy for these uh, to tune them for performance. And we can auto scale them. And I'll talk about more about sysprep, rasprep, link clones, and all that in a moment. You also can mix and match hypervisors. And this is true across the board. RAS supports multiple hypervisor integrations at once. And I'll definitely show you that when we get into the demo. Um, and then persistent and non persistent desktops, we can handle all of those. Okay, and, and persistency means something different to different people. So I'll explain exactly what we mean about that. Um, a VDI desktop is really nothing more than a single remote desktop session host, so a single user using that. That's really a great way to think about it. I always love that quote and put it in there. So when you're kind of trying to make up your mind, um, these are some things to kind of think about back and forth. Um, and remember, you don't have to go 100% solution one way or the other with RAS. You can have different classes of users. Yeah, these guys are power users. They need that desktop. Uh, that's dedicated to them. These other folks, yeah, they really, for what they're doing, they can do the terminal servers, remote desktop servers approach. Okay, linked clones. What is a linked clone? Well, if I was deploying out Windows 10 images across VDI and I said, I don't know, 50 gigs of disk, or 50 gigs of disk, or uh, 50 gigs on the disk of the virtual hard, uh, the virtual hard disk for the image, um, then that starts adding up after a little while, right? What a linked clone does is, you know, that was it looks back at this and it says, you know, from a bits and bytes, a ones and zeros perspective, that's really inefficient because a lot of this is the same. I'm copying the Windows directory, the System32 directory, the DLLs, the XEs, all of that's getting copied over and over and over again. Why would we go ahead and do that? So 
Um, because of that, you can use link clones, which uses a differencing disk, where you have one master image and then smaller, let's call them stub images that are linked to the master. So you've got one master image that handles all that, and then we have all these little bitty differencing disks that are deployed. Now, if you look at it at a hypervisor perspective, you know, you could look at the virtual machine, it's gonna tell you that I've got a 50 gig hard disk on there, right? However, if I went and actually browsed the data store and was to look at each of those individual hard disks, they're only about 10, 15, maybe 20% of the size of the master. So instead of the full 50 gigs, maybe they're only five to 10 gigs. So it saves you a lot of disk space. Um, it also deploys faster. Now, a lot of modern hypervisor equipment um, and vendors, they have data deduplication built right into it. And that may alleviate some of the need to do this because they're, they're doing the data dedupe at the, uh, at the hypervisor level. But something to kind of keep in mind, that's what Link Clones is, okay? Okay, so uh, faster deployment uses less disk space. And like I said, they are fully functioning Windows virtual machines. So, um, and then I'll talk about maintenance mode in a moment. All right, so why would you use, again, one of the others between that session-based versus the, uh, the full desktop for the end users? The session-based, like I said, is generally more efficient. That often leads into lower infrastructure costs and maintenance. Again, your parallels costs are the same. So feel free to use either one that you want to go but they tend to be uh, just overall in general from the number of images that you've got to manage and so forth. Uh, remote desktop servers approach seems to be a little bit less, although you do have to pay, of course, for the Microsoft CALS, the client access licensing. On the VDI side, more flexibility for your end users. Maybe you have power users that can install applications. You have application compatibility issues. This app just won't run in a remote desktop server environment for whatever reason. It can't support the operating system. It doesn't handle multi-user mode, something like that, okay? Um, generally, it does require a little bit more hardware infrastructure because you're just running so many more virtual machines. You can see your costs actually go up. I typically, what I try to do is I start um, just as a consultative approach when I'm thinking about these, I always start with, um, can I give the end users just apps? And if I can give them just apps, that's what I do. Um, because that's providing them what they need. We're all kind of trained for that nowadays because of our smartphones and tablets, there's an app for that. So we're used to just working with apps. Um, and it's the most efficient and easiest for you as an administrator support. So if that's what they need, then that's usually where I go. Then I take the approach, well, okay, for whatever reason, it's not working, at least for this class of users, or it's not working in my, my environment, I need to give them a little bit more. That's when I usually go to the remote desktop server, full desktop, the session based on the left. And then if that's still not working because they need to install apps or I've got app compatibility issues or something, that's when I usually go to VDI. So I usually kind of take that approach you can do whatever you like, but that's just kind of my two cents. Oh, one other last little thing, VDI does not save you from the Microsoft Client Access Licensing cost. You've always got to pay the Microsoft tax. There's something known as a VDA license, Virtual Desktop Access License from Microsoft. So if you're using that approach, you've still got to pay that for that. So one way or another, you're paying the Microsoft tax. So don't let that be the driving decision that you guys have. Okay, moving on, RAS and persistency, like I said, persistency means different things to different people. What we mean by persistency in RAS, think of it more as affinity. So the first time a user logs in, if I've got the persistent checkbox set, and I'll show you where that is when I switch to the demo, RAS will auto assign a virtual machine to the end user, and then that will always be their VM. That will always be their VDI desktop. They will get that same exact one, always. Um, we, can un we can delete unused virtual machines. You can go in there and break that affinity or persistency if you'd like, but, but if you don't do anything, that user will always get the same one. A non-persistent VM, or perhaps a non-affinity VM might be a better word. When a user logs off, that particular VM will go back in the hopper and somebody else can get reassigned so somebody else can use it. And then you can choose what happens to that when it logs off and goes back in the hopper. It could just log off and a new user logs in and away they go, that's pretty quick. Um, we can reboot it, or I can actually blow it away and have it recreated so they can start fresh. You can kind of pick and choose what you want. Uh, from a performance standpoint, just logging off and back on will be the least uh, detrimental to your, your server performance. So that's going to put the least stress on your, your server just doing that. Okay. Um, 
Also, then there's the uh, auto scaling. Like I said, we can auto scale these. He started this in version 16.5, making it a little bit easier to do that. So that was a few versions ago. At this point, I'll show you how we now integrate with the um, with the hypervisors. I just want some stuff up uh, this slide deck here, just so you kind of have it for your own uh, edification, if you will. I'll let you read that later. Um, a couple of other things when you were doing auto scaling, I want to show you this. It does require Active Directory. So if you're going to go down the VDI approach, you must use Active Directory. You might be thinking you can get away without using Active Directory. If you're using a single server all in one, you actually can use local Windows security. I still wouldn't recommend it because Active Directory provides a lot of benefits, including um, extra security with Kerberos, but you can use just a single server, remote desktop session host, you don't need Active Directory. But if you're going to go down the VDI or the RDSH, the auto scaling, you absolutely must use AD. Uh, DHCP is required, and the virtual machine and the host name must match. So um, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that in a moment. And like I did say DHCP already, and then just the same thing with deploying anything, right? If I'm pushing the agents out the first time to your image, uh, you're going to have to install it using the installer or take down the Windows firewall long enough to get the image across and get those firewall ports open using our wizards. Um, we just wouldn't be much of a firewall if I could just plow right through it and push an agent to it, would it? Okay, so with that, uh, the lab configuration is pretty much the same. Active Directory, Domain Join, Windows 2019, etc. I'm gonna show you how to do this. So let's switch back to our environment. Okay, so here we go. This is back into our um, back into our farm we're building out. So I go farm, I go VDI, and then uh, the first thing I need to do is integrate with a provider. So I'll click on my little blue plus. This is the hypervisor that I want to talk to. And you got two options, virtualization or cloud computing. What's cloud computing? Well, I could integrate with Microsoft Azure. So we can do this auto scaling in Azure. Um, AWS will probably be the next one we're adding. I'm not sure when that's coming exactly, so I don't want to give you some dates and say, oh, it's coming in this time frame or not, but it definitely is in the roadmap to add AWS, you know, Amazon Web Services. But as of today, we can do Azure. You want to see this done? Attend the advanced training. <laughs> so we're just going to stick with the on-prem stuff today, which is what this is, the virtualization. So I go ahead and click Next. And then I can pick pretty much any of these hypervisors that we support. So I can go directly to an ESXi host. I can go to vCenter, Hyper-V, Failover Clusters, Nutanix Acropolis, and of course our very good partner, Scale Computing. So I can do any and all of these and walk through it. Now here's where I'm gonna break out of this and I'm gonna switch environments again uh, because this takes a few minutes and we don't have a lot of time and I, we don't really need to watch status bars updates. So I'm gonna show you what it would look like um, for real. So this is an environment that I've already got configured. And you can see I've integrated with different providers at once. I've got a vCenter, I've got um, Scale Computing, I've got Hyper-V. This remote PC, effectively, that just means I've got a pool of remote PCs and I can broker people going to those if you've got physical PCs. So we can do that too. Uh, that's kind of not anything I really want to get into today. But uh, these other ones, we can. So what happens when I integrate with these? We're just talking to these um, hypervisors over um, the network and using an API so you don't have to install any agents or do anything you just add them and let them go that allows me then you can see this guest VM list at the bottom I click on the guest VMs and now I can see um, all the virtual machines that are running in that environment and you can see they're running across all the different hypervisors if I want you may just have one hypervisor most people do um, but you can have them running across all of this. The ones that say not verified, that just means there's not a RAS agent running on those. Like I don't have an agent running on the HALB. Um, here's my domain controllers. I certainly don't need end users connecting to those, so I'm not putting an agent on those. Um, and the ones that say verified are my VDI instances or my remote desktop auto scaling that I've put an agent on there. And you can see I need updates on a couple others. So that's what that lets me do. And then once that's done, I can go ahead and create templates. I wouldn't bother so much with pools. Pools is kind of a, we left it in there for backwards compatibility with older versions of RAS. Also, if you need to do um, existing virtual machines or you're using a pool of remote desktops, that's the get into pools. Typically, almost everybody else would be starting clean and just using templates. So I can come in here to the templates and then I can pick some of these for auto scaling. 
Now, to give you an idea, let me switch over to my um, VMware environment here. And I'm going to log into this virtual machine that I have ready to go. Just to give you an idea. So here it is. It's called in vCenter Win10 VDI. But remember, I said that the name in the hypervisor, so this is the name VMware gave it, it's going to have to match the Windows host name, Win10 VDI. So that has to match this, um, creating that virtual machine template, or it won't work. How do we even know about this over here, right? Raz will query this, they're gonna see the virtual machine name, and then we're gonna to try to push the agents over the network using the host name. So this and this have to match. That's really the big one. All right, let me go ahead and log off this. Shut down, and I'm gonna sign out. Okay, he's out. And I don't really even need to have the virtual console up and running anymore. So I've already got some existing, but I'm going to create a new template. So I'm going to go up here and click on our little blue plus. And then I'm going to go look for that. And I think we called that W10 VDI, right? There it is. Uh, actually, it actually has an agent on it. We'll just update it here. So that's fine. I'll go ahead and click OK. It's a virtual desktop. It's not an RD session host. It's a Windows 10 image. I'll go to Next. Okay, it says there's an agent on there. Um, I need to update it. This is the same thing. If it didn't have an agent, there would be an install button here instead of an update. So I'll click update. Okay, there we go. It's all done. And you can see it actually not only installed the agent, but it double checked the remote access was enabled. And if you can squint really hard and read the small text, it's added the users to the remote desktop users group. So that it's actually useful. I'll just go ahead and click done. It's installed now, and now we can just walk through the wizard. I'll go ahead and click next. Template name is Win10 VDI. Um, what's the maximum number of virtual machines? I have a very small environment. I'm going to set mine to five, right? This is the max. Don't set it above that or the hardware is going to explode. Let's go ahead and have it deploy uh, two virtual machines right up front. This is the naming convention, W10V-VDI, and then it's going to append uh, the ID. So it'll be W10VDI 0001, 002, etc. Just keep in mind, if you've got a really long name here, you can cause problems. Um, you're going to exceed the Windows buffer and it'll probably fail and blow up and do some weird stuff. So um, when you're naming these, just don't make them too terribly long. That's all because we are appending this to it. Um, full clone, link clone, I'm going to go ahead and do link clones. I'll go ahead and click next. The next set is my buffer. So because we are deploying new virtual machines, I'm going to start with three, right? But I could have potentially five or 100 or 200 users if I had the proper hardware for that. Um, once it fills up, once I reach the number of virtual machines that's um, deployed, Raz will deploy a couple of more because I set the buffer to two and then a couple of more. And then every time a user logs in, we're going to make sure there's always at least two open because I set the buffer to two until I reach my maximum and then it won't deploy anymore because it does take a little bit to actually deploy it because we're cloning and deploying a virtual machine. A lot of this is very dependent on your hardware. So that's what's going to go on. Um, once it's done, I can set the VM state. Uh, powered off, powered on, suspended. I'll just leave it powered off for now to save us some stuff. And then I can also choose what happens to them once it's not being used. So if nobody uses it after, I don't know, a month, well, that person's never coming back. We'll go ahead and deep six it for us and delete it. I'll just leave that as off and never for right now. Then I'll go to next. Um, if I had folders or resource pools or anything like this, I could do that, uh, set those here. Mine's a very simple little lab environment, so I'll leave it alone. Um, oops, I guess I can't. So I'll have to actually pick my host. So this is the host that I've got, and then I've only got um, one of each of these. So my fault, sorry about that. Um, that's my resource pools in the physical host. So once that's done, I will go on. And then this is RASPREP, SysPREP. I think we all know what SysPREP is. It rolls back the installation so it can deal out a new uh, security identifier. What the heck's RASPREP? It's the same thing, only it's more efficient. We, our developers, took a look at SysPrep and we said, boy, that's really inefficient. You're having to reboot a bunch of times. So RASPREP eliminates a lot of those reboots and it deploys faster. So um, I'll do that. If it's a standalone not joined to the domain, you need to know the uh, local user as well as the Active Directory user. And then once that's in place, then you'll know where to put the target in. 
uh, it, it has to go into an OU or container somewhere inside the domain. So that's done. You can also browse for it if you'd like. So it needs this to be able to read the domain and this has to be an account that's got local admin privileges to be able to do stuff, okay? Next again, and then this is that setting where we can deploy the FS logics settings again. I'm not gonna do it here just for the sake of brevity. Next, and then I also am gonna leave off the optimization. So it's the same thing we did inside of the um, remote desktop servers. I'm leaving this off again, just so it'll deploy faster for us. If I was wanting this in production, yeah, I sure would want this running, but just for this, I want it to deploy faster. So I'll go next. Um, here's your Windows keys, right? Do you have a key management service? Do you have a multiple key, a key that can be activated multiple times? It's kind of up to you, plug in what you want. I'm just gonna leave that alone and just use the basic non-activated Windows because these aren't gonna last very long in my lab. Next, and then here's a finish, and then there we go. And then I click apply, and then it's going to um, kick off that installation. There we go, so now it's deploying. So if I look over on VMware, back at my vCenter, um, and I was to scroll down here, it'll start showing up in a minute. I actually would start seeing this be completed. And this W10 VDI will ultimately switch to being a VMware template. And then um, you'll see images being deployed off of that. You can see some of the, the, these others that have that that are already going, uh, like W10 Fin. I've got one, two, and three. And then down here, W10 Fin. This is actually VMware template. So we're converting it to a template for you. Um, if you're looking at it in another platform, this is scale, very fast um, compute center. It's hyper-converged infrastructure. Like I said, one of our very good partners. Uh, very inexpensive also. They tend to target about the same markets that we do. What's really nice about this is you can see they actually add that tag. So when you see the template tag, that means that this isn't a proper virtual machine in the scale environment. It's one that we're using, or it is a proper virtual machine, but it's actually not one you should be messing with because it's a RAS template. And then we're deploying virtual machines up there. So I did my auto scaling here. Here's a Windows uh, 2019 server that I created RDSH-AS for auto scale because I'm creative like that. And you can see it's deploying multiple ones of those. Okay, um, if you're at Hyper-V or one of the other hypervisors, it won't actually convert it to a template. It'll just be a powered off virtual machine. So you'd need to be a little bit more careful with those. But we absolutely do support Hyper-V. That's probably the, uh, the hypervisor that most folks are using. Okay, going back to the environment while this is going, let's review some of these other settings that we have. So I kind of walked you through all that. Um, from, if I click on the desktops, you can see who is using what desktop and whether it's been pre-created or not, and then whether it was auto-assigned, and then I can break the auto-assignment here if I want to. We'll get into sessions in a moment when I do the whole session thing. Uh, the other thing is I can auto-scale, um, I can go back in here and review some of these settings uh, if I want to change anything in terms of, you know, where it's located, sysprep, rasprep, user profile information, here's the optimizations, the keys, and all that. This one also is pretty important. We don't ask you this in the wizard, but I can do settings and I can choose what happens again across all, this, all of them or onesie twosies, where what happens when an end user does something. So if they disconnect, I can just do nothing, meaning they disconnect, but I can also shut down, restart, suspend, etc. If they do something like log off, this is where I can set it to unassign. So it'll go back in the hopper. Someone else can use it shut down, restart, suspend, or I can blow it away, or I can have it recreated so somebody always gets a clean virtual machine. Okay. Now to make these available, uh, I go over here to publishing. We walked through the publishing of apps earlier, um, but I can go ahead and click add, and then a desktop. I go next, it's a virtual desktop. This is if I wanted to publish a terminal server desktop, and then I'll go ahead and click next. And then I can pick a pool or I can just pick a template. And I'll pick the template and go next. And then I'll give it a name, uh, W10, I don't know, General Use. General Sue, General Use, <laughs> I don't know who General Sue is. Um, and then I can exclude from session pre-launch. So I'll talk about pre-launch in a moment. We can have it start automatically when the user logs in, all sorts of stuff. Here's that persistent and non the persistent checkbox. And remember what this does. This doesn't blow the virtual machine away. This assigns the virtual machine and the user will always have that. Or 
If I uncheck it, it means it will go back in the hopper and then somebody else has it available or it's available for somebody else. All right. I'm going to cancel this just because this takes a minute sometimes to finish and I want us to be able to keep going. Um, from a remote desktop server, as I said, you can do this, the whole templating thing with a terminal server. A couple of cool things that you can do that if I go up to RD session hosts on this is here's my um, group that I've created that I cleverly called auto scaling and inside the groups there's an auto scale tab here's where I can actually assign resources to this so a terminal server you know it's not one-to-one -one. how do I know when to deploy more well right here I can set the max number of servers to be deployed in this group and then I can uh, give it information like um, what happens and no, oh, that's the right one. Um, you know, what happens when it reaches a certain threshold? That was the setting I was missing there. Uh, if you, um, or just didn't see. So once it reaches like 70, 75% of resources, we'll deploy another one and then we'll deploy another one. And then the drain is also the other thing I can do. You know, once it reaches below a certain threshold, so if you have seasonal workloads, it's not being used very heavily anymore. It's being used some because remember we're we're resource load balancing that, but once it goes down below a certain threshold, we can decide, okay, let's scale down. So we'll put it in drain mode, which means as users log off, they won't be logging back into this particular remote desktop server. They'll be logging into another one, and then once the number of users on this hit zero, we can blow it away and deep six it. So we can scale up and scale down your environment. Okay, so let's move over, and um, I'm gonna move back to this environment again here real quick and I'm actually going to log into the um, other environment and then get through the self-signed certificate because I want to show you what it looks like accessing a desktop so yes we'll accept cookies to this so I'll just log in with uh, let's log in with Mae West again right So, yep, let's allow the Parallels client. So I can do the desktop in two different ways as well. I can certainly do um, just using the Parallels client integrated, right? And that's really exciting because it looks like this. I'm on a Mac. You can see here's my little window. If I was in Windows, it would look like the little X and the dash and all that up there in the box. Um, it's just a full desktop and I would get discrete screens, etc. But if I want to go clientless access, I can go ahead and do this and I'll launch the HR desktop clientlessly and we'll see it's logging me in. Okay, there we go. So you can tell it's clientlessly be or clientless because I am um, I'm running in a tab on the web browser. You're like, well, that's cute, but it's not very useful, right? I, I can't see much of the screen. I've got to scroll up and down using this little bar. Well, look at this. I've got this little thing at the top where I can go full screen or I can dismiss it. Um, and then we have this little parallels toolbar over here as well. So I could have clicked full screen there. I also can click it right here. And now I've gone full screen. All right, and that's just the little windows telling me that I've gone full screen, blah, blah. But now I'm running in a tab in the browser, but I've got a full featured desktop over here. And then the little toolbar on the right still exists. So I can break out a full screen. I can do that upload, download. I can do the clipboard. I can do all sorts of stuff. So that's the clientless access. So I can go clientless. I can go full screen or I can full screen clientless and I can do the other methods as well. So I'll go ahead and close out of this. So. Okay, and that wraps up VDI and pretty much the base infrastructure. We're now getting down the home stretch here. Let's go back to the management console and I want to show you a couple other things. I am on farm and then we'll go to RD session host. I've alluded to this, but there's a scheduler. Remember, I can come in here into groups and I can create different groups and add servers to the groups for management. That allows me to uh, do a bunch of different things, including that auto scaling I showed you earlier. But I also can run a scheduler. So if I come in here to the session host and the scheduler and click on the blue plus, I can disable servers or groups or reboot groups of servers, remote desktop servers for maintenance windows. There's warnings that pop out to users. There's drain modes, so it's not so disruptive. But you can schedule your maintenance windows this way and do things. 
For session management, under Remote Desktop Session Hosts, I can click on Sessions here, and then I can see who's logged in. And I've got hardly anybody logged in here, as you can see, just a couple, uh, one's even idle. Um, but I can come in here and manage the session. So I can go right click and uh, request remote controls, send a message, hey, log off, maintenance window. I can log them off, I can disconnect uh, if you get a stuck sessions in a VDI instance or anything like that. But a couple of new things that we have in here, if I go full screen in version 18 and later, is we've got the, um, the user experience evaluator, this UX evaluator. So I've got all these metrics over here. I know they're hard to read on my big screen, but you can kind of see that and I can scroll over and there's even more. But I've got all these user metrics that you can use to help try to figure out why a user may or may not be having, um, an app may not be performing right. It could just be their, their bandwidth on the end user side. But it tells you, you know, what the operating system is, what they're coming from from a client standpoint, all sorts of things. I can break out of this. Um, I can get a little bit more granular, but I actually can right click on one of these and go to uh, show information. And this shows me a lot of information about what's going on with the user itself. So I can evaluate everything from in here. I can export this out to a CSV file or whatever. And I also can right click and come down here and do monitoring settings. And I can pick and choose even more data that I can find out about. So there's all sorts of things from a user experience standpoint down here that you can figure out. And I'll go ahead and cancel out of this. And you also you can do this from VDI sessions as well. So if I go to farm and VDI and sessions, I don't have anybody logged in, but I would get the same exact experience here. Um, from an administration standpoint, I can have, let me go to accounts, I can have multiple users that are admins. So everybody can have their own admin account. You don't have to use just all the administrator account. Please don't do that. But I, I can also define like power users or custom admins, change permissions, so I can have help desk personnel or junior personnel or something like that be helpful, but not, not too helpful. Um, one thing really cool is for help desk personnel and for uh, maybe even power users is I can grant them session management capabilities. This would allow them to log into the console if you wanted, and then the only thing that they could see would be the uh, session management information down here. Uh, and if I go to the web browser, remember that we talked about, um, we installed that web admin console at the very beginning. Well, it's right here. So if I just um, go to the server name, and then it's a different port. It's on 2443. There's also a start menu button that got added. Um, this is the management console. Mae West does not have uh, admin privileges or anything that I've granted her, but I could. But you could give um, a power user or help desk personnel access to this and they could come into a web portal and then do a lot of that session management here as well. Starting in version 18, we've improved this quite a bit. This used to be really only a help desk tool, but now I can come in here and I can actually modify settings. So I can click on the site and see what's running on in my environment. I can go down to infrastructure. So remember that nice dashboard look where I had to go to the RAS console and look at the dashboard to see what was green, green, what's being used. Now I could just go to a web page and monitor all these settings for virtual desktops, uh, the gateways, my publishing agents. Um, I can do a few things under the certificates here. And, um, and also I can redo a lot of the publishing settings. Uh, speaking of the publishing settings, let me minimize that and go back to the console. Uh, we did publish apps and we did walk through publishing the um, virtual desktops, but we didn't look at any of these settings either. I now have access to all these tabs all the way across the top, like publish from. So if I start adding servers to the environment, I can pick different groups, have different sets of applications. I can cherry pick individual, individual servers. I can do all this without having to republish an application. So just do it once and then you can change it on the fly. Other things that I can do also is review the application tabs. So we chose the easy button when we published this where it uh, filled out all these things for me. Now I can, um, you can actually come in here and change things. Um, if it didn't show up being registered with Windows, I could have browsed and found the executable. I can add different switches or parameters. I can tell it to start automatically. I can exclude it from session pre-launch. I'll talk about that in a minute. And then this other really cool button here is verify targets. Now paint, of course, is installed on all my servers, but if I had a different application 
and I'd published and maybe it was launching for some users but not all users and it seemed to be random as to who what, well maybe I just happened to forget to install it on a server. Do verify targets, it'll help you figure that out. Um, other thing too is to keep in mind when you're installing applications across multiple remote desktop servers, this path needs to be the same across the servers because we're calling the path. So make sure you do that. Filtering is one of the most useful features. It's probably the one you would use the most. This controls who sees what. So if I um, just publish an application, it's immediately available to everybody that has access to the system. You know, maybe I don't want Mae West being able to access paint. Well, I could apply a filter. I could apply the user filter. I would check this box. It says allow the following users, click the blue plus, and then only uh, domain admins can access paint. No one else, only domain admins get to paint. It's that important, right? And that will print, uh, prevent Mae West from spending her day in paint. So you can choose who sees what by doing this. There's also a bunch of other filters that you can apply. They all layer together. A very common one is the IP address filter. You know, maybe it's a financial app. Yeah, you're a member of the financial groups. So you can see it, but only in the office because you're coming from an IP range that I recognize. If you're coming from a range I don't recognize, you could be at Starbucks or wherever. I don't want you pulling up our financial data there. Come to the office to see this. So you can do things like that, all right? Choose where and so forth. Uh, these other ones, I'll let you explore themselves. Some things like the shortcuts tab. Um, remember I created the shortcuts on the desktop from the end users? Well, it did that here because <laughs> Um, I could have done it programmatically here if I wanted to. And then also they can add them to the start menu. I think it went ahead and did this. So if I click on the start and yep, parallels remote application server apps. These are the remote apps that I painted. They're not the local apps on the server. Those are up top under accessories. So um, usually wouldn't use these mission critical apps, but it would be clear, but, but that's the point. I can actually, if you wanna use the client, um, and this again is only for the client and only features available on Windows, I could give them a very seamless experience like that if I wanted to. Uh, the quick keypads, this is actually a macro. It looks like I was messing around a minute ago during the break and I created one, but uh, WordPad, so maybe I would go to WordPad and pick it up and say, oh, that one's for WordPad, and I could sign a quick keypad for them for WordPad. What is a quick keypad? It's useful for if I'm on a mobile device, like an iOS or Android device. I could come in here and create a WordPad or an app, and I could sign it app by app. This one I created for WordPad. I created a very silly one called Undo and Control Z. I could create another one that says, I don't know, new. Um, new. <laughs> and then I literally just have to hold the control button on my keyboard and press N, and there it is. And then now um, they'll see a button at the bottom of their virtual key keyboard on an Android or iOS tablet or something like that, and then just press that instead of doing these awkward keystrokes. You know, Control N and Control Z are kind of silly, but if you've got an application that's got like a, you know, three fingers or something awkward or just something people use all the time but maybe don't remember the key short, keyboard shortcut, you could do this very quickly and then the end users could just see that at the bottom and hit the undo or the new or, or whatever it is that you're trying to do. But again, it only works on those mobile devices because it uses a virtual keyboard. All right, uh, farm and themes, before I forget one other thing here, is this is where you could control the different themes. The default theme is that nice bread parallels theme that we've seen, but if I wanted to, I could come in here and change the uh, branding and add my own lo logo, uh, including the little parallels logo at the bottom, remember here on paint, that's this logo here, if you can see that in the screen, um, so that users will then be clued in that it's a remote app and not a local app. I can also change all the colors and you would do all that here. And to give you an idea of what the different themes might look like, um, I've got the other server up over here, let's see. You can even do a shortcut, like uh, here's one I create called reverse, it just, um, reverses the uh, the colors instead of being red and black or you know and all these are going to the same server so you can create different themes for the different for the same RAS farm if you want different people kind of uh, logging into the same thing okay oops made a typo on that one yeah if you type up and screw that up then you're not going to get the uh, the thing right you'll see this little message here all right so that's it with themes let's just work our way down here uh, we've talked about keyboards or uh, quick keypads. Universal printing, I talked about already. 
Um, it just kind of works right out of the box. Most of all these other settings in here, you're going to have to, um, that's when you're on the phone with support and they're doing that. Generally, it works right out of the box. Uh, the one that is a little bit different is this printer retention. It's a double-edged sword. You need to pick on which way you want to go. If I have printer retention off, that's very good if users are floating between different workstations and different devices. What that means is we will re-enumerate the printers every time they log in. All right, it can take a little bit longer when they log in before their printers are available, but at least they'll be available as they move from workstation to workstation or device to device. If I set it to on, then we're gonna remember what they were and we're not gonna enumerate them, re-enumerate them very quickly. So it's great if I'm always connecting from the same device, then my printers will be there almost instantly. Um, not the login time so much, that'll happen, but it's just it can take a few minutes or three before your printers become available. If somebody needs to log in and print real quick. That's what I'm talking about. However, turning printer retention on means that floating between different devices isn't gonna work so well. It is a global setting for the entire site. So you need to kind of keep that in mind as you make that, make your choice, uh, your choice there. Fonts is the other one that could be very useful. We have a bunch of fonts built in. We don't transfer all fonts. Some fonts are built into every kind of client device in the world. But where you really might want to come in here and, and do this is if you've got a special font, like maybe you're printing barcodes uh, that can be scanned in later, uh, and you have a special barcode font, you might want to add that in, and you can do that right here on this page. You only need to do it here in the console, single pane of glass management, and it'll be available across all the devices, virtual desktops, all the remote desktop servers that you're publishing apps from, and so forth. So it'll do it all. You don't have to go device by device. Universal scanning also works right out of the box. It almost works like um, printing, we, except for a couple little differences. We do support WIA and Twain. WIA, it's typically disabled, so I'd have to right-click and enable it on the server. The reason it's disabled is it requires the desktop experience and actually a sub-feature under that. You know, the Microsoft Server Manager add roles and features. There's one called Ink and Handwriting Services. That's required. Um, on the more modern versions, I think 2016 and later, um, that's already on. If you're connecting to an older server like 2012 R2 or something, it's not. So you would need to add and enable that before you right-click and enable. That's why it's off by default. As for Twain, um, you don't have to do anything like that, but for Twain, you do have to come here and click on this Twain applications at the bottom, and then you can explicitly list the applications using the little plus button here that are gonna be used for scanning. Sometimes keep in mind, if you've got a very large EMR or ERP type application, sometimes the scanning function is a separate executable. You'd need to find, locate that executable, and that's what you would, you would um, add right here. Uh, scanning does require the client. Of course, it works with the HTML5 interface as long as you're using the client under the covers, and it does work only in um, Windows, workstations, and Macs. We've added capabilities for Macs as well. So Windows and Macs only, and it does require using the client. The connection icon down here, uh, multi-factor authentication. This is where you could set all that. If you wanted, wanted to uh, do two-factor authentication, we integrate with a bunch of providers. The most common one is the Google Authenticator. You can also use this to support the Microsoft Authenticator because any OTP will actually work with this. If you're gonna use the Microsoft Authenticator, just click on Settings and then change this from Google to Microsoft so your end users don't get confused. Um, we do have some exclusions, so if you don't want all your users to do that, you can exclude certain Active Directory groups. I can also exclude by IP address so that if people are in the office, they won't get challenged. If they're at home, they will get challenged. We walk through a very quick setup of this in the advanced training, so if you want to see more, attend that. And SAML as well, that's well beyond what I'm going to do today. It's, takes a long time to set that up. Well, not a long time, but it takes a while. Very specific. That's also in the advanced training. Uh, the other tab here really is the authentication tab. Username, password, Active Directory is your first line of defense. We do still support smart cards, so you can do that. And then under the settings, uh, this does confuse some people. These are RAS settings. This is about um, logging off sessions and things like that that are idle. This does it from a RAS licensing standpoint. It'll declare them idle and log them off uh, so you're not getting charged that user as a license. It won't physically log them off the terminal server or the VDI desktop. You need to go into group policy and use the Microsoft settings if you want them to log off after a while. Usually an hour and a half is pretty good. I like to let them go to a meeting or get some lunch 
and not just log them off instantly. But you know, if they're going to be gone for a few hours, we're going to log them off even if they forgot to log off. Uh, you can choose all you want to do for that. That's all your own. Device manager, this is a way to um, manage the devices and see what's logged in. I've hardly got anybody done here, but you can go into uh, Windows. Uh, here you go. You can see who was logged in and who's not and what they're connecting from. You can also take control of them using the um, right here. If it showed up with a device that was supported, meaning it's running on a Windows workstation, I could right click and say take control. That would give me even or manage it. That would give me more control over the client device. It does require a reboot on the client side. And then I could come in here into Windows device groups and do things like um, replace the desktop. So instead of using the Explorer shell, you're using the, um, the Parallels client as a shell and then a kiosk mode would take away even the uh, start button. So effectively, here's a poor man's version. This isn't exactly what it looks like, but it's close. Uh, they would log in and they would just see the applications that you've published. That's it, no desktop or anything. And if you put it into kiosk mode, you take away all this stuff down in the taskbar. So they can't start, shut down, log off, play solitaire, surf the internet. I mean, assuming you haven't published the browser or anything, right? Um, that's what it does. It's a cheap way of turning a Windows fat client and reposition or purposing it as an older uh, thin client. Uh, most people don't do this. If they want to do that, they would go by zero clients or something like that. We support a lot of that. RAS policies is the next one. And we're, we're getting real close here, almost done. RAS policies is a way to centrally control things. It applies to users and groups. In Active Directory, typically you wouldn't pick on an individual user, but you might have one for like all your users that you set up. Um, and then this policy would apply to all of them. All these settings here, remember the connection properties I went to in the client, right? Here's the client, and then I go right click, connection properties, and then I see the connection tab that lines up with this. Here's the display tab that lines up with that. If the policy is applied and this box is checked, it will take away these tabs from the end users, meaning they can't change things. They have to accept what you set centrally. So the tree on the left determines what you're controlling via policy, and you can check everything if you'd like, and then the action is on the right. But what this does is it lets you do things such as if I go to disk drives, no local disk drive access for you. No, you can't plug in USB devices, and no, you can't use the clipboard, right? The Windows clipboard to copy and paste between the local and remote session because I don't want you transferring data off the server or the VDI instance because this is a secure environment. Or, you know, you could take the opposite approach. Hey, this is an education environment and this is your homework. Save it wherever you want, right? Disk drives, clipboards, plug in a USB key. I don't really care. You can kind of do all of that. Um, by the way, if the clipboard is on and you have the local disk drive access, if you're on a Windows workstation or a Mac, you can not only do copy and paste, you can do drag and drop from the local server to the remote workstation and from the remote back. Not all applications support this. Just keep that in mind. Um, so it won't work for everything, but many do. Um, just about every application, you can right click, copy, right click, paste. But the drag and drop, um, you have to have this turned on and you gotta be using Windows and Mac or Mac Workstation and um, uh, the application has to support it. There's all sorts of stuff in here like this that you can control. You know, I can get down here to um, uh, the user experience or performance. Uh, we usually detect the connection quality automatically, but if an end user, a group of end users are coming from a low bandwidth, a uh, high latency area, you could actually come in here and just bump them down automatically and be preactive. We're gonna set this up. Uh, that keeps one user from being able to hog everything because we usually, when you connect, we try to give you the best available. And maybe if you've got, you know, the first few users in, they'll have a good connection and everybody else will be kind of uh, uh, running slower until we adjust. Um, the connection performance in the back end, you could just be proactive about that and say, yep, everybody's running on this. And that will optimize it for that connection. So that's something that you can do. <coughs> I mean, there's other things in here too, like multi-monitor. You can take away their multi-monitor if you're feeling evil one day. And then session pre-launch is a big one. I showed about talked about that earlier. <coughs> what session pre-launch does and I can turn it on to basic means I can figure the schedule and the times or machine learning is the really cool one. And what machine learning does is Raz will figure out when your users are starting and launching certain apps or virtual desktops or whatever, and we will log them in ahead of time. It only works if they're coming from a Windows workstation for security reasons, 
but this can prevent login storms and um, other stress on your hardware from that event. So if you have a situation where everybody's logging in at like, I don't know, eight in the morning on Monday and launching their applications, logins put a lot of stress on your servers. So, um, and then the users are kind of already grumpy because it's Monday and then now it's taking forever to log in and then your servers are running slow and it's just a nightmare. Monday morning, welcome to that, right? Um, that You can always get faster hardware or you can do machine learning, in which case Raz will figure out, it usually takes about two weeks-ish to get this dialed in so everybody's doing, know what everybody's doing. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and log them in ahead of time. We'll start logging them in at like four or five in the morning. We'll space the logins out so we're not stressing out the servers. And then when the end users come in and they launch their applications, they're not having to go through a login process. They're just reconnecting to a session that's already open. So it's very fast for them and it doesn't put as much stress on your server. So very, very cool setting. Okay, um, I talked a little bit about administration. Two other things we can do here under monitoring is there's monitoring and reporting. So for monitoring, I'm actually gonna run the monitor uh, installer right here so you can see this. This is really brain dead simple. I just run it and I take the defaults. I go next, yes, we always agree. Next, next, install. Okay, so once that's done, I can click finish, and I actually could just access the monitor as its own standalone thing, but if I uncheck that and click finish, there's also this browser plugin that you can download from Parallels, and I'll run this. And when that's installed, then I can actually um, access it from here. And let me switch over to this other system so that we can see that. Here's what it looks like once I've done the monitor installation. Right, I get full health and uh, performance statistics across my entire farm from everything. All the different hosts, the agents, sees what's going on. I can do CPU usage, that's an easy one to monitor. I can collapse that and expand that out to look at like, here's the disk usage, all sorts of stuff right here. Um, that actually is configured under the administration and then the reporting uh, tab. And you would just check enable performance monitor and put in where I put it. Uh, reporting works pretty much the same, point to where you did it. The only thing about reporting, it is the one component that does require SQL Server. I don't have time to go through it today, but you need to install SQL. It runs on its own instance. There's ways to share it and all that. Um, it's in the lab guide and the training manual. There's a knowledge base article. It's in the administration guide. There's all sorts of information. We're very, very specific about the SQL install, so follow those steps very closely. Take the defaults, use the names that we recommend. You've got to have a user and active directory. Just use all that and it'll light right up for you. Um, it's a little bit of a pain to get SQL configured, but once you do it one time, then it's good. And then for the reporting instance, it installs just like the monitor did, just next, 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 the defaults, here it is. And then from then, you can go into the reporting here and um, you got all these reports available to you, right? Um, and you can create custom reports if you'd like. So if you really wanna get fancy, we have some documentation on that. That's a little bit beyond what I have time to get into today, but you can do that. And then you can kind of come in here and check all the reports. So application usage is a big one, right? Uh, what apps are being used most frequently and things like that. They're all right in here under these different five, uh, five categories. <coughs> Okay, last little bit under the administration piece is uh, the mail settings. So I can go to the mailbox <coughs> and you can integrate with your mail server. So when you integrate with the mail server, that lets you do two things. I can then send invitations out to the end users. Remember way back when I first installed and start, there was this deploy or invite end users, deploy virtual desktop, advanced training. Um, but I can deploy, invite users and I would click this. This is actually gonna walk me through configuring my mailbox, but then I can send users an email about how to get access to the Windows system. So you send them an email and it'll have a link to the HTML5 interface. If you wanna use the client, they actually would get a link that would download the Parallels client for them. And then um, there's another link in there that would have them configure the client so they could use the client directly and have them configure it. So you can do that as well.
All right, let's break out of this real quick. One last little cool thing I wanted to show you that's new in version 18. If I move down to the um, load balancing icon, there it is. We do have, um, these settings have always been here. You can look at them if you want. This is where you can do the resource-based load balancing for the terminal servers or remote desktop servers. But we now have the CPU op optimization tab where you can get in here and get very granular about how you want the uh, CPU optimization to go. Okay, we are now running down on the true home stretch. Just a few minutes to go. I'm going to switch back to the PowerPoint slides. I want to wrap up with just a couple of quick things. Um, in these slides, just so you have them, is some quick information about setting up RAS reporting. Here we go. This is those three steps. Like I said, install SQL, do parallels reporting installation, and to do the server configuration. This is a few tips and tricks to not forget as you're going through there. Like I said, the SQL piece is very, very specific. And then, um, the install, like I said, is pretty easy. You just run it, install it right on the SQL Server itself, and then if it fails for whatever reason, double check the steps in the training manual or the lab manual, the admin guide, or something like that, because most likely it's just the step that was missed installing the SQL Server and configuring the SQL Server. Okay, and with that, we're down to the last section, and really this, I just want to introduce a couple of additional features that are pretty new to Parallels in version 18 uh, that I want you to be aware of. So. FS Logics, we talked about that already. So I've showed you where that is. This gives you some additional information about um, just that, and it's mostly a reminder because we've covered this already. And then this is the a little bit more detail on the user experience evaluator and the advanced sessions details that we kind of looked at when we were looking at the session information. This one is new, and I didn't talk about it when I was doing VDI and auto scaling. Um, we do have a lot of uh, typically smaller customers. They've got like a group of uh, hosts, but they're not using a SAN. And all these hosts are like controlled by a common vCenter or in a common Microsoft cluster, I guess, if you will, using the current release. But they're managed um, centrally. And then you can't deploy templates in RAS to separate virtual or to separate hypervisor hosts, or at least you couldn't. Um, unless they were using shared storage. Now you can. So it's a feature that allows us to take advantage of using shared and independent storage on every node. You always could do that if you were using um, just standalone hosts. But this is way if you have them like grouped, like I said, under a common vCenter, but you haven't sprung out, shelled out for the SAN, that kind of thing. This is there. Um, the web portal, the new information that we kind of talked through about all the things that you can now do in that, that also um, is here, just as a reminder. And this is really cool. I just didn't have time to demonstrate it today, but I wanted to make sure you know about it. We have really speeded up uh, the download file. You know, where we do the file, save as, you find your local hard disk, and then you try to transfer a file down or up. And if you do this in a standard RDP window, you can do that, but it is really slow. Really slow. Um, we've added some enhanced features in here that make that really fast. So it's really, really quick going up and down. And this kind of talks about how we work it, um, work using that. But it's really, really fast. So it's now no longer that just painfully slow download and upload that's a limitation of RDP more than anything but we've kind of worked around that. So it's another big differentiator um, uh, just over using native remote desktop services for whatever reason. Okay, the CPU load balancer, I talked about this. Like I said, it does give us better um, management with granular control, higher user density, lower hardware footprint, all that good stuff, right? Because you can change the CPU priority based on your configurations. This actually was introduced a little bit older. I didn't have a chance to, or a, a version or two ago, I didn't have a chance to show you the uh, the Android and iPad uh, device experience. It is a brilliant experience. I highly recommend you try it. Um, you can use native touch gestures. You can use, like I said, the virtual keypad, um, the quick keypads that we showed. You can use your finger to make very precise mouse clicks. That's always been one of the great challenges. There's no need to use an external mouse. You can print from these using Apple AirPrint or whatever. Um, file print, pick the 2X Universal printer and it'll come right out your printer if you've got Apple AirPrint set up or whatever you do on the Android devices. And we now can take advantage on the iPad of multitasking. So if you do kind of that split screen look on it, we can certainly do that as well. And, and also in that slide over mode. 
All right, and with that, we are really done, done, done with the training. Please keep in mind, like I said, you will have a follow-up email sent to you. There is a link to the recording and to the slide deck. Um, so you will have access to all that. There's a Dropbox that I maintained. It'll have a link in the Dropbox that has the training manual. Um, it'll also have the lab manual and all of that if you can't get into the partner portal. I do keep the slide deck in there and the recording and so forth. So all that's available in that. Um, keep an eye out for that follow-up email. It usually comes out a day or three after. So sometimes it's kind of quick, sometimes it's not. I think it's pretty quick now and they've automated it, but give it a day or two. If not, just uh, uh, let your sales rep or your partner manager know or whatever, and they'll make sure that you get that. But that'll have all that information. And it also will contain a survey. Please fill out the survey. And we're not a car dealership. Please fill it out honestly. Uh, so fill out the survey honestly and let us know what you think. You're not going to hurt my feelings. You're not going to get me into trouble. We're constantly trying to improve the training. So if you have some comments or anything like that, just um, fill it out and let us know. We can kind of make adjustments. So please fill it out honestly. And if you liked it, let me know. Always happy to hear that too. And remember to take the exam. It's very helpful to have the grass console in front of you when you do that. So if we ask what hypervisors we support, you can just kind of go to that point in the interface. Um, there's also going to be some questions on there always about, um, you know, about the specs, hardware and software specs. So make sure you know that. And of course, this is where you go to take it. It's a duplicate of the slide that I had earlier. And with that, finally, we are done. Congratulations, we made it. We got in, uh, we finished on time. And thank you, thank you so much for attending. I'm gonna hang out for a few minutes, so I'll be here for a little while. Um, I'm gonna go, kinda of go on mute, but um, we'll answer stuff and I'm gonna make sure that everything has been answered in the chat window that we didn't get to. So we'll take a look at that for a little bit. But thank you so much for attending. Um, and have a great day, everybody. If you don't wanna hang around for the questions, uh, you're, free, you're free to go. But I'll be here for a few more minutes. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. I think we've got them all answered. You can always send us an email if you need to to follow up. We're always happy to answer that. Thank you. Thank you so much for attending. I'm going to go ahead and close out the uh, WebEx now. But thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day. Bye.